Hello and welcome to the Exotic Pet Collective, where we talk about tarantulas, scorpions, and all pets exotic. I'm your host, Richard. You may know me from my YouTube channel, The Tarantula Collective. And today we have a special guest joining me to discuss breeding and dealing tarantulas and their experiences in the exotic pet hobby. But first, this week's episode is brought to you by the tarantulacollective.com. If you're looking for care sheets, a list of reputable tarantula and exotic pet dealers, like tonight's guest, exotic pet enclosures and supplies, discount codes, and even Tarantula Collective merchandise, then be sure to check out the tarantulacollective.com. Find all things tarantula and exotic pet related and stay connected and up to date with everything happening in the collective by visiting the website. And if you want to look behind the scenes and get updates on everything else that's going on, be sure to sign up for the mailing list so you'll receive the collective newsletter. That's the tarantulacollective.com. Now, today's guest is someone that I've gotten to know a lot better over the past couple of years. Uh, he's very knowledgeable about some aspects of the hobby that I know very little. And he's even let me interview him and quote him in the past on some controversial topics. He's been part of the USA Tarantula hobby for 11 years and has been breeding now for five years. He is the owner of Simply Spiders. So please welcome to the podcast, Dustin Blevins. <laughs> welcome, Dustin. It's awesome to have you. Uh, how, how, how are things going? Oh, they're going real good, man. I'm really happy to be on here. Really excited to do this. Very cool. And uh, as I just mentioned, you've been breeding tarantulas now for five years. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, so I started off breeding about five years ago. Uh, one of my good friends, Ruth Krauper, uh, she was the one who basically helped me with my first pairing ever. Uh, I think a pair P. Armenia. Uh, never got a sack from it, but that was my first pairing. I went super smooth, so, but thanks to her, because, man, she's been a big help over the time frame of my breeding career. Yeah, Ruth, she's from uh, Mostly Reptiles, right? That- yeah, Mostly Reptiles. Yeah, she, uh, so, a lot of people don't know, like, uh, Ruth, one of the main reasons I've uh, been in this hobby and do what I do, because, uh, well, when we started this off, she was the one who basically taught me everything I knew. I started seeing her at shows and stuff, and she uh, kept being very knowledgeable with me, and I felt she knew what she was talking about. So every time I did research, I realized her information was accurate. So I kept getting to know her better. And so when I actually started off Simply Spiders, I based my company off of her name. Uh, she's such a good friend. So uh, she was mostly reptile. So I was like, I'm going to be just Simply Spiders. <laughs> I, I met her and her husband at NARBC a couple years ago. And they were they were very kind to me. They were, they, were, they seem like very nice people, very genuine, and uh, I'm a big fan of hers. Yeah, they're, they're good people. So you are in, and again, I, I I may be incorrect in my information, so I'm running it by you. So correct me if I'm wrong. But you're in the St. Louis area, is that correct? Yeah. So I'm in like uh, St. Charles County, which is right outside of St. Louis. So. Uh, it's more like people work in the city and then live out here. It's something I'm curious about is, uh, and, and I don't know why it's go- what's going on, but something's happening in St. Louis because it seems like over the past year or two, there's uh, just it's it seems like it's becoming this mecca for tarantulas. I mean, we got simply spiders, tarantula cribs is making enclosures. They're out there in St. Louis. You got tarantula cat. I mean, it just seems like you got a lot of, of breeders and dealers and. A lot of people that are, you've got the tarantula takeover happening there now. Um, so what's happening? What's what's going on? Why are you all so into tarantulas out there? I think it's funny because uh, back in the day when I first started in the reptile hobby, uh, my buddy Mickey, he's been a best friend of mine for like 13 years now. He runs Show Me Snakes Reptile Show. And like back in the day, I used to breed and sell chameleons. And I used to do a lot of local shows around here and stuff. And uh, my love for that, I realized, was more for the hobby than anything. So I really wanted to find where my niche was. But at the same time, when I was like trying to build my business, he was trying to build his shows. He's always wanted to have like an educational platform. And uh, well, at, at the time, there were only three vendors at the show that sold tarantulas. One was uh, Bobby Bowman, one was Ruth, and uh, one was Tiffany. She's a head entomologist at Kansas State University. And uh, I learned a lot from Bobby and Ruth, and uh, during that time, I 
got my first tarantula from a girl that vended this show uh, one time. Her name's Cecilia. And as this time, the show, he started doing the local show and everything kind of worked out uh, miraculously for the St. Louis hobby, honestly. I don't know. Uh, so Mickey started his show and then uh, I started my company. And as his show grew, my company did too. And he uh, allowed me to base my basic platform off of his shows. So mostly I was doing all of his shows that he uh, had. And then Bobby was also doing his shows and Ruth was doing his shows. And everybody saw like how, I don't know, the way we set up our table, we tried to display it as like their artwork. They're not just like pets and stuff, like they're living artwork to me. So I try to make sure they're as pretty and snazzy as they can be when they're on the table. And like people really respect that. And I think a lot of vendors at this show take, uh, pride in their setup and everything. So as time has grown, the the show did too. And it has become like a mega center for like, there's multiple vendors now. They do the tarantula takeover specifically at the Show Me Snakes Reptile Show. Uh, Mickey and me have always been uh, very cool buddies. And it's really cool to see not only his, his dream grown, but so is mine and a lot of people on the hobbies as well. Like, <clears throat> I got a... I know Cad. I got to meet the guy who owned Tarantula and Cribs recently. Like, it's really cool to see how something like five years ago was not like this and where it's at now, you know. But I think a lot of it has to do with, honestly, the Show Me Snakes Reptile Show. I think uh, Mickey's dedication and uh, expression of his passion for the hobby has been uh, a key to the hobby here in St. Louis. All right. So uh, for somebody that hasn't been to the uh – to a tarantula takeover show. Can you explain the difference between just like a, a normal show me reptile show and the tarantula takeover? Okay. Yeah. So the building that it's in is a machinist hall. Uh, it's like a union hall and it has two separate floors to it. And what Mickey does is basically puts all the vendors for the tarantula takeover upstairs. Now, uh, I dark den or exotic layer. Or no, dark, den, dark, den, dark den was dark there. Den. Uh, the very first takeover and cat was there and everybody had like a, a platform where they were able to meet YouTubers and uh, all that kind of jazz. Like it was really cool. We had a bunch of awesome vendors there. There was us and there was uh, gosh, I don't even remember. There was just a ton of them, but uh, yeah, overall it was a great, great time. We did it this year again, but unfortunately it was during COVID. So um we had to be very minimal and basic with everything. Uh, it was more sectioned off this time, but next year he's going to blow it up again. So that's cool. Yeah. I actually, uh, I, I was talking to, uh, Mo from, I think Elion from, I may have mispronounced her name. I just had it written down <laughs> from tarantula cribs. And they told me they were going to the tarantula takeover and were trying to convince me to go as well. Uh, just so we could like meet. Uh, but it just, essentially my wife was like, she was like, no, you're not, you're not going because <laughs> uh, it's a, I live in a pretty small town and she didn't want me to be the guy that uh, ended up getting COVID and brought it back. One of my employees was like, bro, you got to check out his cages. And I went over there and they were incredible. And I actually just put in a huge wholesale order with him because we're going to bring out a lot of this stuff into uh, his cages. That's awesome. Yeah, they got some. They got some good, good enclosures. So I mean, I was disappointed I wasn't able to go, but hopefully it will go. I'll be able to go next year. But that's yeah. That's what I was. I was. Yeah, I just I was just curious. You know, are there a lot more tarantula dealers for for the the tarantula take? Like, what makes it a tarantula takeover? Okay, so it's multiple tarantula dealers. So uh, I don't know how many people he fit up there, but there was quite a few. Um, so there's like Tiffany was there this last time. Floyd from Floyd out in Kansas. I'm horrible with people's business names. I know people more on a personal level, and that's how I base my business out of than I do like their actual business names. But uh, there was like a whole bunch of really awesome people. There was like I don't know, Mickey. Like I said, takes pride in the vendors he has at his show. So he, uh, the people he has there, he wants to make sure are quality and respectable people. So. Very cool. And it turned out great. There was probably, I think, at least 30, even during COVID. So, Oh, wow. That's quite a turnout. Yeah, it was a decent turnout. I'm not. I'm horrible with numbers, but somewhere it was a good turnout for 
yeah. going through a pandemic, you know? Yeah. I mean, I know even going to uh, Tinley Park in ARBC, there's, you know, maybe five or ten tarantula breeders there, you know, maybe. And that's like people that also sell snakes that have tarantulas. Uh, so that's that's pretty cool. I think that's like Mickey's end goal is he wants like eventually to be able to have a show of where it's like he can do something like that, you know. He uh, yeah. he has a passion for it, so I don't see why he won't take it that far, you know. It was Great. cool recently in ARGC came to St. Louis, so I got to do that show I too. I heard that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It's because they weren't able to do it in Tinley. Is that is that why they did it in St. Louis? Or so, like, yeah, I heard they they couldn't do it because of all the COVID issues and whatnot. They were very very uh, strict on their mask rules and everything here. It was actually a great a great time. Uh, I love NARBC. I can't help it, man. Some of my favorite people like spend just one time of the year that fly down and get a hang out at NARBC, like. Usually I have like six dudes hanging out here crashing for the weekend. It's pretty awesome. So how, how far away are you from Tinley? Okay, so from the St. Louis NARBC, we were like 10 minutes. So I could just like, okay. I, yeah, it was great because if I forgot something, I was able to go home or send somebody. But uh, from Chicago, we're like maybe five hours. It's just Tinley south of Chicago. But uh, we've also done Scott's. All Animal Expo and we in Illinois up there before too. I try to stay a lap around like five hours of St. Louis typically. Yeah, I think um, I can't remember now. I feel like for us to drive there was twelve hours, something like that. Thirteen hours, maybe a little bit longer. It, it was. It's a long. It's an all day drive. <laughs> right. Yeah, I remember. I, really that was my first time I got to meet you. Was up at Tinley uh, at yeah. uh, Fear Not Stable, and at first yeah. I was like. I have to admit, man, I was like, at first, Oscar, I was like, it's Richard Stewart, man. And yeah, <laughs> you've like become like a really good, solid friend over the years and stuff, man. It was really cool. But I'm really excited. We're finally moving out west a little bit. In December, we're going to be doing the Herbs Pueblo, Colorado show. So nice. that's a 13-hour drive from here. So we're going to go out a few days earlier. I love to hike, so we're going to go hike through the woods or the mountains. But it's uh, that's one of the things I'm like hoping with with the channel is especially. I mean, it was something I was planning on doing this summer, but it kind of got waylaid uh, by all the lockdowns and stuff. But was wanting to be able to have that ability to go to a lot more tarantula shows and or you know reptile shows, get out and you know kind of meet people because it seemed like really the only places I go is Tinley Park and ARBC. Like that's that's just kind of it. Um, occasionally I'll go to one up in Pittsburgh, but I love people. I don't know. I like to talk to people. Yeah. I have people over to my house every single day. It's, uh, I don't know. So doing shows is something that is a passion of mine. Like once we get the company settled and everything, I have goals. Like I want to do more shows and I want to actually go out further distances to do them. But, uh, yeah, like the herb show is kind of the start of like a new platform for us, just wanting to travel more and get to meet my customers on a personal level. I think like that's a key to why my business is because like I genuinely care about people. And uh, I don't know, I want to see like I love seeing people that love the same stuff as me happy and that I'm able to provide them with that, you know? So, yeah. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? Okay, so in January, I'll be 33. 33, okay. Yeah, because I, I, I remember like when I was in my 20s, I really liked people. I liked being around, had people over. But somewhere around 35, I turned into this hermit old man that's like, I'll go out and, and hang out with you for two hours, but then I'm going home and no one's allowed here. <laughs> okay, I feel that most of the time. Like, I have definitely recently become more, uh, I like to stay home. My business is my whole basement. So, like, there's this room and then my living area corridors are out there and uh so there's how much i don't need outside of the house so a lot of people come here but yeah. yeah i have to admit i was in i've always dealt with people i was a server and then i was a licensed body piercer for 13 years and i actually retired from that to focus on my business for a while we had a uh we had a, a, a mat at a, in front of our front door that just said go away <laughs> It's like, Dude, I love it. I swear. <laughs> don't need to be here. Here my face, I mean, it's not that I don't like people. I just, I just, I just like my alone time. I like, I like some privacy and yeah, I get people a lot of times they like invite themselves over, you know, like they send me a message or an email like, Hey, if I, uh, if I'm ever in your area, can I come over and check out your collection? And I'm like, I don't know you. No, <laughs> like I appreciate that you're a fan 
But you gotta. It, that's why I make YouTube videos so I can show people. I, I'm I'm weird about having people in my house, even like that I work with or you know no like acquaintances from around town. So like having strangers over is a. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, maybe that it's kind of cool. I live with my parents. Uh, my dad has frontal lobe dementia, and me being able to run this business at home is key because I get to stay home and help take care of him. Uh, so that's why I'm very thankful for my customers and what they do and support. Uh, but with that, I also have like a buddy who crashes here and uh, most of the time, and he is here to help take care of that. Derek. Uh, he is a solid, he is my full-time employee. He's the one who packages and ships like everybody's orders. He brings like 90% of the stuff here. But he uh, he is he lives here and helps take care of my dad with me and my mom. And uh, it's really cool because, dude, my house is a revolving door. There's yeah. uh, people that are over here on a daily basis just to learn. Customers come over. I like to do with people one-on-one. -on -one. It cancels out a lot of the issues that, uh, maybe technology would or whatever. Uh, you know how bad I am with computers, so uh, <laughs> it just saves me a lot of heartache or headache when I can just deal with that person instead of like dealing with their heartache when they accidentally kill that spider because they relied on some bad information. You know. Yeah, that's commendable, man. I uh, I when I was in my twenties, I was I had an open door policy. Like I, I mean, to the point that uh, I mean, I was a little bit of a hippie back then, but it's like some hippie people living on the street. I was like, you can stay here and have like 10 people living in my little one bedroom apartment, just sleeping on floors and couches. And you know, it was, it was great, but you know, I get older and got a family now and it's, it's kind of like, just, just leave me alone. I wasn't so supportive that there was like anybody else here. I would probably have a, a stricter policy on that, but man, we don't sleep much around here. So uh, we're oh, always yeah. tarantulaing until like 4 a.m. It's crazy. So so how many tarantulas, like as a breeder, how long does it take to feed all of those tarantulas? Uh, it takes about, I don't know, two days, eight hours with three people. Yeah, so two days, eight hours, three people. Uh, but you have to understand, we fart around and goof off and watch South Park and Harry Potter. And I mean, usually when it's a feeding day, it's a big ordeal. Like, I order pizza and we rock out doing whatever we need to do. And the, the majority of them are spiderlings, I would assume. Is that right? Or do you okay, have like so, a lot of... Well, with Derek's collections here too. So you have to understand that with the business stock and all together spider-wise, there's 2,000 here. That includes business stock. That includes my breedy, breeders. So this room that we're sitting in, like most of the stuff behind me over on the side Derek's and then mine. But there's like nine shelves in here full. Um, so that's just the tarantula room in here. And then out in our living quarters, we have a eight foot long cabinet full of adults and juvies. And then we have like stuff. We do a cool down period for some species too. So this room stays very hot. It's like 84 degrees in here. And then the outside is like 69 where I sleep and everything. So we do like, right now I have a Chalenza that's about to drop because we're chilling. We had to cool her down over a very long period of time. Well, actually it's been a short period of time. But she's already started webbing, so we're going to bring her back in here to raise up her temperatures, and that's kind of key to get them to drop. H. Chilinus, is that what you said? That's a, uh, what do they call it, the flame rump tarantula? I'm so that's excited fine. about this one, Dad. I'm like, yeah. Okay, so we have two here that I've paired, and I don't know, me and Derek, uh, since he does stay here so often, we get bored and we research, and uh, I have to admit, shout out to Bird Spider CH, man, like, his information is solid, and if you just listen to what he's saying and you look around, like, you learn a lot, and, like, you just do some basic research, hit up a rag on boards and stuff, you learn some tricks and trades, and I just got a good feeling about this one, man. I've never had a lens that's so comfortable in her enclosure, so. I've got I've got one. I got a couple years ago. Yeah, after your podcast with Alex, I actually hit him up, and I was like, bro, I got a good feeling about this lens that I'm sending you some if it turns out good. Nice. Yeah, he, he'll he'll appreciate that. So you breed how many how many uh, species would you say that you breed? Like uh, we'll just say like uh, every month. How many breeding projects you got going on? We breed something every day. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, so me, yeah. So there's something bright every day here. Uh, our collection of adults to juvie is quite intense. So, uh, but so far, I don't know, man. Derek's been a blessing. I can't even tell you like in how many ways, like family wise, business wise. But uh, breeding-wise, he uh, has kind of taken over the program 
So last two years, I produced like around 20 sacks each year. We're at 43 this year, and we're not even done. And we have like, I don't know, or not. There is at least 11 species that are going to drop within the next two weeks. Yeah, actually, I have to give it. I have to give credit where credit's due, man. Like, I am more the people person, and Derek really helps out with like the spider aspect of things. So how He's many a people solid breeder, man. He just That's started good. too, like just <laughs> January, and dude, he's been rocking out species. His first pairing was T. Solidonia. So, oh wow. So how? Yeah, he how was there. Many? He came over to my house the first time to buy a spider, and when he did, he I was like, I'm just going to toss in the Celadonia, the one that had the good sack. And uh, sure enough, his first pairing ever to witness was the T. Celadonia. How many people does it take to, to run a business like yours? Oh, uh, man, it takes an army. This ain't, uh, this is, I consider my people family, though. Uh, so they're always over to my house. They're not just, like, over here to do business. They're over here to play Smash Bros. and, like, 007. I'm old school. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, so it takes, I have me who runs it, and then Jess and Bubba, best, they own BL Tarantulas. Uh, they just do, like, wholesaling to multiple vendors. Uh, they uh, come over multiple times. They're my, they, let's just say for God, for any reason, shape, or form, something happened to me, the business would yeah. go to them. And then uh, they have been just solid players and a part of this business and I couldn't have done it without him. And then there's Derek. And then I have a buddy, Scott, who is actually an exterminator, but he comes over and helps feed part-time. And then we have a buddy named Aaron who comes over and helps feed and do little extra things that I need. So there's yeah. five or six of us. So yeah, people think like, Oh, it's just the spider. Yeah. It's 2000 of them. And like, you're always having to rehouse something or I can't tell you how much eco work we go through. Yeah, that's that's uh, one of the reasons I wanted to get you on the podcast is because, I mean, I have, I think I, I last count was uh, right around 150 tarantulas. I've gotten rid of some, and some of, you know, mature males or just old age have died off and, and things like that. Um, but I know how much time and effort I put into maintaining and feeding. And when I think about the breeders, like I know you guys catch a lot of flack. At least I see a lot of flack that's given to People that sell tarantulas, people accusing you all of like price gouging or charging way too much for a species. And I'm like, you got to take into consideration the amount of time and effort that they put in. And they, some of these species, you guys are probably housing for months at a time before they sell. So, I mean, that's like constant feeding, watering, rehousing, uh, all the stuff that you got. Like, there's a lot of work it, that I'm sure goes into it that, you know, those of us that just are buying them aren't even aware of. So I kind of wanted to get like a peek behind the the curtain a little bit and, and just know like what's some, what what, it, what all what kind of work goes into this man to be honest it's kind of crazy and like just just not eat her head over off on the corner because like sometimes i feel like linda blair man like uh it's a lot it really is like i just designed a website i'm not really familiar with technology but just on a day-to-day -day basis like we wake up we have to take the first thing we do is like ski in the room because like the heat and humidity is so crazy in here you have to see what happens where and if somebody developed mold or an egg sac dropped or um and then like feeding wise like it's intense because you have to make sure like yeah you have to realize like there's a lot of slings around here but that's just one cup of a thousand that are in tubs and on shelves and stuff and you want to give each and every single animal the exact same adequate care that like they need you know so like you can't skip one like it's not like a choice that you have like oh these animals didn't get fed today so i'm gonna just go to bed because i'm tired and they can get fed later like no i don't have time that week to do it because like we have to ship out 40 packages this week and we have to make straws and cut paper towels and um i have to talk to my customers i was doing business like dealing with my customers on a one-on-one -on -one basis i'm still going to continue doing that but it's going to be every purchase is going to be through the website just to adhere to facebook policies like it's a it's more so time i have to be honest man i deal with the people aspect more uh and the information like Derek handles the animals, and, like, when he comes in here, usually him and Jess and Bubba are usually the ones that feed this stuff. Like, I'm rarely 
involved in my hysterics, like, oh my God, you got to check this out and see that it's molten. Like, I have to take my time at 4 a.m. to come in here when they're out and like appreciate them for what they are. Like, it's kind of crazy because it turned in from like, oh, I can work with these animals every single second of my time. Like, so where I need like five employees to be able to like give everything in adequate care. And like, we don't just, I don't know, we care about them. We don't just, as you can tell from behind us, just put a piece of uh, some cork bark and stuff straight in there. Like, there is tubs of plants out in the <laughs> area. <laughs> And like tubs of eco earth and stuff because man, I want them to feel comfortable while they're here. Like I love these things. Like I think a lot of people understand me when I say like a lot of the time people suck, but these guys don't. You know, like I love these creatures. I can always rely on them when uh when the world is kind of let me down, you know. Like there's a lot that goes into taking care of two thousand of them though. And as a business owner, I always have to realize like if for some reason it's just me, these are my responsibility, you know, and uh, it's a lot to have on their shoulders. And I don't know, a lot of people uh, have used the term, you're a big name breeder recently with me. That drives me crazy. <laughs> uh, I don't know yeah. what you all are talking about on that. Like, dude, I'm a passionate hobbyist. And like, I do this yeah. because I love the hobby and I love these spiders. And like, there ain't no big name. There is no end glory to this. This is, this is and has and always will be about the spiders like a lot of people are doing a lot of dumb things for money recently and like you guys need to remember where you're uh what it's always been about and it's about being able to appreciate these and like being able to continue this on for the people later on in life who want the opportunity to to i feel you like i i uh i always had respect and admiration to breed for breeders and dealers because i knew that there was probably a lot of work but i didn't uh, I don't think I fully realized just how much work it was. And, and this is just like a small example, but my scorpions started just having babies like crazy. And I had over, I had like 120 little baby scorpions and I, I was sending off like a hundred of them just to one, like I just had to pack them up and send them to one place and just, just having to feed them and water them, you know, twice a week and then package them all up and put them in a box and mail that. I was like, this is why I don't breed and deal tarantulas. This is a lot of work. I don't enjoy this. A G man. So me and him. Okay. So we have, over, we have definitely overcome the aspect of like, people don't want to deal with pokies. They're like, how do you get that pokey in a straw? Well, after a while, you like 11 years of the hobby, you kind of get how animals are going to work in like how you can do stuff smart and respectably for the animal. But man, me and Derek can pack some spiders. We did a competition between me and Derek because he's a he's a smack talker, man. He will smack talk any chance he gets. But he was like, I'm gonna re let's rehouse 40 OBTs. I think they were actually going to Tanya. And he was like, You do 20, I'll do 20. I'm gonna beat you. So we did it like we had Jess be the ref and everything, and he's like, I'm gonna do it without a tub. I was like, big mistake. But I ended up beating him and everything. Like there's definitely a point where you feel comfortable with the spider and stuff but dude with 40 packages sometimes those spiders or there's 20 spiders in that order like it's a 12-hour process and that's not even making boxes i know like we have pre-made boxes and even just taping those together like not even making the foam is just like an hour like <laughs> it's crazy how much time it takes uh don't run a business and make sure it's done right. I can only imagine. Now you mentioned that you sent some OBTs to Tanya, uh, with a fear not tarantulas. How often does that kind of stuff happen? Like how often, like, like you're breeding and selling tarantulas, you have a business. She's also breeding and selling tarantulas with her business. So in, you would think logically you guys are competitors, but how, how much back and forth, like you guys sell each other stock. Is that kind of how, yeah, but that's not, I don't know. There's a bigger goal in this man. Like, uh, I think a lot of people think like us breeders are trying to take advantage of whatever we actually work together. Uh, the reason a lot of people have the same stock right now is because we all sell and trade and everything. Like there's a, I try to get my stuff from private breeders. Like I like working with individuals. I like working with companies that do things right. So if they have extras and they're trying to, a lot of people don't have time to take care of that stuff. They don't have mm -hmm. five or six employees that can come help take care of their spiders. So sometimes it's easier for vendors just to 
wholesale off lots to people like me at a, a decent price. And then I, that's what I'm saying. There's an overhead to everything that people don't realize. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, you can import spiders for whatever cost. Yeah. You can say that, that like, okay, you're getting a, let's say a geniculata at $10 on import cost. You don't also consider there's import fees involved in that. There's also the time that it's going to take that, that person is going to be sitting on a hundred of them that they're going to be feeding and watering, raising Then the time to like distribute and market those. Then the people that it's going to take when they get here to be fed, like there is a overhead to running a business with 2000 spiders. That's unbelievable. Like I never went to school for business or anything. This is all brand new to me. Like I learn and screw up as I go. And I just have had very understanding people, uh, customers that have just been fantastic and uh it's just been incredible but yeah i don't know what i'm doing anybody can do and this. like have a like i think the key to business man is like have integrity and character and show people you care like i don't know we live in a world where like it's, everybody's so self-centered and like i don't know you can ask nine a ton of my customers like sometimes i'll just throw in a spider in somebody's box because no one i know is going to make a smile on their day did it cost me that $10 that I had to pay for that spider? Yeah, but realistically, do that smile. I'm going to get a text that's like, hey, you messed up my orders. I have received these. You messed up my order. There's a, a extra one in here. Yeah, there is. I hope it made your day. You know, like I knew you wanted that. So I don't know. Yeah. Sometimes you could just got to take care of people and people appreciate being cared about. And I genuinely care. Yeah, that's that's very cool. Like uh, you just recently launched your website, so I I know that you know the pain now of of setting up a website. Like that's one of those most simple things that a business like I needed a website for the Tarantula Collective, and I was like, this isn't going to be an issue. Well, it's a website. How hard could it be? Those things, even when you use a pre made template, there's still a lot of work goes in setting up a website and a lot of expense. So you got a lot of time, a lot of costs, like. Uh, it can be very time consuming. And I think that a lot of people um, forget about that. They think it's like, it, uh, it's very easy for them to view it and, and go through it. They don't think about every picture, every line of text, every link. That's all, you know, very meticulously uh, designed and put in there. And just that, that whole user uh, experience is it takes a lot of time and effort to do. And that all that costs money and all that, as far as a business is concerned is, is overhead that has to, you know, be included in the price, uh, for, you know, tarantulas or t-shirts or whatever it is you're selling. So, um, you launched your website cause you, you were, you originally were just selling this, you know, on Facebook, right? Like you, you kind of got hit with the whole Facebook policy drama. Yeah. Stuff. So actually I'm going to give a huge shout out to your admin team because if it wasn't for them, I probably would have like still figured out a way how to sell them. <laughs> Facebook, but uh, yeah, they definitely uh, approached me like they're like, We really like you, but we can't really like, I don't want to get nobody's page banned or nothing for me doing sales. Like, and I know it sounded more so that I was lazy and didn't want to make a website, it was just that I was ignorant. Like, I have never taken a computer class, let alone like worked on a computer before. But uh, so, but Tanya Higgins and uh, a couple of other people really helped push me in the right direction. And then William West from uh, Exotics Unlimited, that he was a, he helped me out so much. Like I got stuck on so much stuff and then Jess did all the core like uh, information and whatnot on it. But it, that Facebook policy sucked. I got banned on every platform. I mean, my business page got banned, my distribution page got banned, my personal page got banned. So it was kind of a rush to get it done. And when we actually re, uh, launching a business page today so it really kind of adds a whole nother level of credibility to you when you have an actual website that people can go yeah to. it feels good too man like once you get started doing it you realize like i can make this my own like i have to admit i've been on a lot of different people's websites recently and i feel mine's very me like i like it because it's me you know so yeah. uh i didn't want something that was gonna because i'm not so technologically smart uh I didn't want somebody to have to be like me and feel they had to go on my website and know how to work a computer to do so. I wanted it to be something that they could just click by their spider and be done with it. I still want to encourage people to use uh, me online if they have questions or problems. Like, like I said, I really do care about my customers and my hobby a lot. And like, 
I want people to have accurate information and it's not all going to be on that website. Like I do encourage people to highly hit me up if you have questions or issues. So you got the website going on. Um, I, I was taking a look at it before we, uh, we got on the, on the podcast and uh, you know, it, it's exciting stuff. You've got like a, you know, all your slings, juveniles, adults. Um, you said that, uh, and I noticed you've also got a link to a YouTube channel here. So you've been, you've been making YouTube videos. It looks. Oh like. my gosh. Yeah, somebody called me <laughs> that experience the man? other day. I was like, no, it's happened. But uh, no, yeah. So I just feel like, I don't know. I'm very blessed to have the platform I have. And uh, back in the day, I got into an argument with a YouTuber about them using their platform for the good and instead of like drama and stuff, you know. And uh, I just wanted to make sh- sure that I have a platform that I can give out accurate information. It was really more so, and I'm going to be very honest, based upon the Celadonia, uh, they're a lot more in the hobby recently, lately, and uh, no one has, like, correct information. I saw a lot of them keeping it in vials and stuff, little vials, and I guess, like, there's many ways of keeping Celadonia and stuff, but that's not, like, my preferred method, and I, okay. there's not one species I would say I'm more comfortable with than, than uh, the Celadonia, honestly. Uh, I just wanted people to treat treat them right. They deserve to be yeah. treated right, man. As you can tell, like I have my female tattooed on my hand. Like uh, that that spider to me is a, it means a lot. It was cool. It was it was the beginning of my hobby to me, and to be one of the people, one of the not I was like one of the first like five openly open people about producing Solidonia in the country. Yeah, and uh, to be a part of that is like the legacy, the dream I've always wanted. Like it was, I cried. I could still cry. It's just so cool to me. I don't know. Yeah. You've, you've brought, you've brought up T Celadonia twice now. They're my oh, yeah. favorite. I can't help it. Actually, there's one of my babies right there. I don't and know. They're my uh, and I love them to death. So I understand. And and we can't talk about T Celadonia without at least touching on the fact that they're also a kind of controversial species here in in the States. Um, yeah, they sure are. Are there any new developments in that area? Okay, so no, not that I know of. I think like the person that would have the most accurate information on this, honestly, is Tom Patterson. Uh, me and Tom have talked before. I don't mind saying this because I think he encourages people to hit him up about get, seeking information on this. Um, but this is basically how it stands as of right now. Um, the La- the Celadonia fall under the Lacey Act. You are 100% right. So if you want to be technical about it, they're illegal, okay? Yes, you're right. Fish and Wildlife Services, just because they're not coming and taking Celadonia or whatever, doesn't mean that they're not illegal. But to be honest with you, if you want to look at it that way, so is 90% of the species in everyone's collection. Because anything that's endemic to Brazil follows under that Lacey Act at that point. I think people just like to talk and create drama. And until they the lawsuit's over with and Fish and Wildlife Service releases a policy, it's all hearsay. The person who's going to have the most accurate information, though, is going to be Tom Patterson. And he, it's because he's the one who federally is facing his his export license and everything with those issues. But to be honest, uh, they're not coming in your home. They're not taking them. They're so widely distributed. Now, I'm not the only person in St. Louis that has them. Like, uh, I know... I could say I could tell a hundred people. I, I know of a hundred people that have them. And uh, but the one thing I did that Fish and Wildlife Services, when I talked to them about, they did ask me not to sell them. So what I did was I distributed them to respectable breeders who I think will take care of them and use them for uh, the right purpose in the future. And uh, so that's what I did with my half of my first sack. And unfortunately, the second sack of them, they paired for four minutes, uh, but I never saw any answers. The male fell, the female fell, ended up the next morning. The male was old. He had died the next morning. So she did end up laying a sack, but I kind of knew it was going to be bad. Uh, I kept telling Derek to keep an eye on it, keep an eye on it. On the third day, uh, she did kick the sack. But I'm giving her this molt off, and then I'll be pairing her again. But I did just find out uh, one of my juvie Celadonias is a female. So I have another female, and we'll be continuing this project for uh, future breeding so i'm very excited about it yeah if i, I get to breed video in this room and have 2000 solidonia i would i'm just throwing that out there so <laughs> uh 
they yeah. a lot of people are like they're lame they're in a trap door no they're not lame because like yeah you see i don't know like i said i see spiders as artwork you see a piece of wood and you see something dull and ugly and like but as soon as you disturb that trap you see something that's the most the most beautiful to some people terrifying thing they've ever seen in their life and to me that's something special and that's something to keep you know i i feel you there i uh, i made that video a few months back or uh, man i guess it's been longer than that now uh, just about the the legal issues surrounding the t celadonia and caught a lot of flack from people saying i was like a a, a celadonia hater and, and and i was like no i don't i really i think it's a gorgeous species i would love to have it but you know what to me the the main difference between that species and other brazilian species has and it has always been that species was confiscated recently by fish and wildlife service and and they they very specifically said you can't have this species and be and breeding it and selling it mainly because of all i mean it was like it was a big deal it was uh, they were they had uh, uh, articles you know and and when the species was originally described you know what i mean like national geographic and I, it was like it was like everybody wanted it you know we were like oh, this is amazing this is beautiful i can't wait till this gets in the hobby and you saw all these people in europe uh that, like they can they can sell them and breed them openly there there's no lacy act there uh they, they, they're also a whole lot cheaper there and it sucks being in, in the u.s and seeing the species like just being so freely available that we want that is is like kind of has a shroud of controversy here in the u.s and i I understand there are a lot of brazilian species that would fall under that lacy act and technically could be considered illegal but that one in particular kind of seems like uh it was it was a very specific the fish and wildlife service was like looking out for it and when they saw it they like put their finger on it like no (laughs) and so it makes me nervous uh like i personally i would love to have one one day you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not, and, I, and I'm not saying you're a bad person because you're breeding them or anything like that. Like, that's not what I'm saying at all either, which I think some people kind of get mixed up. Like I am totally for it. I personally think it's much better for it to be in the hobby than in Brazil right now. Like if it was, if it was trapped in the Brazilian rainforests, those are being destroyed at an exponential rate right now. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's native habitat isn't going to be around much longer at this rate. So I think it's great. It's, it's, it's it's very important for it to kind of survive in the hobby. It just it just is frustrating that fish and wildlife is not. They just won't come out and say one way or the other. You know what I mean? There really needs to be some kind of. When you said you were doing that cast, you were like, I want to. I would like to quote you on this, and I was like, absolutely. So uh, there's a lot of things that people don't realize, like Celadonia. I saw an import list that had Celadonia on it in 1991. So it was an older one that I found like on a random boards. Like if people do their research, there's information out there. Uh, like the they this isn't a like a new subject, but when Brazil's like, holy moly, they're shipping out these spiders at dirt cheap and we're not getting paid for it. Of course I'm gonna reenact this or I'm gonna force this upon everybody because I'm the government. I'm not getting paid. Like our government does it too. It's uh that's what Fish and Wildlife Service basically is. It's the government's way of being able to make sure that they get their money, you know. But in reality, it's like I have a really hard time with a really hard time with the government saying that something I'm doing is illegal when I consider it morally wrong. Like, I don't think it's right that they don't encourage breeding programs here in the United States for pokies and stuff doesn't allow state travel on that or celadonia or causing issues like this this is a good thing for the hobby this is a good thing like that people are standing up for themselves and like being like no morally this isn't okay you're talking about okay the in Sri Lanka all this land's being bought to destroy the land that they're on and whatnot cool but why you tell me it's morally or it's illegal for me to breed this species when it's morally something that needs to be done you know i don't know i have a really hard time with that but yeah and there's two sides to that story though i mean from when you look at it from another perspective like i understand the other side as well people you know you've you've got your scientists and and lawmakers and stuff that are saying the pet trade is part of the reason these these things are endangered because people are going in there and they're poaching them they're taking out way too many at one time uh they're they're grabbing gravid females and they're they're bringing them into the pet trade just to sell them they don't care about spiders they care about profits 
So as long as we want them and we, you know, just like drugs, you know, that people aren't, you know, risking their lives to bring cocaine into the country. But if, if nobody was using cocaine, there wouldn't be any cocaine. You know what I mean? The, the drug trafficking would kind of dissipate. Uh, so I think that they are taking that same kind of war on drugs mentality and applying it to not just tarantulas, but also other reptiles and stuff like that. Thinking if we can kill the demand, uh, make it illegal, then people won't be doing this. But I also... Like, I know that's where they're coming from, and I understand when people have that argument, but it seems like it, it, if you were allowed to just, if, if the, you at least make the ones that are here in the U.S. legal and let us captive breed them and sell them, it would sustain them in the hobby and, and keep them from becoming extinct, even if their natural habitat was completely destroyed. I have to agree with you on that, that they should allow it to be captive bred. Anything that's here in the hobby, I agree with that. But let me tell you, man, Over the years, I've learned a little bit of wisdom, especially in this hobby. It is so much easier to point a finger at something to distract from what's actually going on. Now, you can, like, yeah, there is a lot of poaching and there is brown boxing and stuff. Like, the crazy part about this hobby is people talk. People talk a lot. So I hear a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff I don't really even care about, okay? But realistically... The government's way of dealing with this is all about money. Don't think that those wood companies also, who owns those? Like, the go- who's taking this land? Who's purchasing this land? Like, I don't know. I think it's really easy to point fingers and be like, oh, it's poaching. But that doesn't, that's only because it doesn't put any responsibility on stuff that we have to take care of as, uh, as a government, you know, and I don't know. I, I do see it in both ways, but I am not going to lie. I am so far the other way of like, okay, because I understand brown box and I've seen many things happen over the years. I know, I understand when it comes to, I get what happened with Peru and everything. I know the sources and everything, the whole drama and all that. So with that being said, yeah, I kind of get it, but I'm so much more leaning towards the story of like, these are government owned anyway, so they're going to do whatever they can get to get their money. It just, uh, I don't know. I think everything has to do with money in this hobby. And unfortunately it's not about the animals when it comes to like endangered species and stuff like that. Cause there's so much, we don't have to pull from the hobby or from the wild. If they would just allow us to breed it here in the hobby and distribute it properly and not have people scared that they're doing something wrong just because the, these people over here are saying this is wrong. Okay, you're the one that says this is wrong, but this huge, large group of people is saying this is not wrong. You're, how can you tell me that? Because morally, I, I just don't understand that. I never will. But I try to respect the laws as much as humanly possible when I follow the ESA guidelines and everything. I just will always speak on, on how I just don't understand how morally the government can tell me something that I don't know. We wouldn't have maybe potentially have to worry if you want to play like if they want to play that card. We wouldn't maybe potentially have to worry about poaching if they would just let us breed what we need to. So I don't know. It's it's a toss and turn yeah, situation. And I, I, you know? I agree with you. Um, part I'm just par- partially just playing devil's advocate here. Uh, you know, trying to speak for the other side. I'm not saying that I 100 percent agree with them. My my whole thing is that I I really believe that if if the if it is an endangered species and their native habitat is being threatened, then 100% they should be protected. Uh, but if that species, Postletheria in particular, is kind of what I'm referring to, if it's already well established in the hobby, people are already breeding them and have been selling them for years or decades. Like making it illegal for them to be transported across state lines seems ridiculous. That seems like it's much more of a harmful policy than a helpful policy. Does that make sense? No, I agree with you 100%. I have to admit, I love talking to angels, and I love getting into the nitty-gritty like this. So, uh, But realistically, like, no, I totally understand where you're coming from, and I would agree with you on the aspects of, like, there are situations, there is different variables for every situation, you know, and uh, all I know is I always just try to do what I feel is right and what is by law ethically for me to do so uh with the celadonia just because there hasn't been they've had many times they have, they have had plenty of time to determine whether these were going to be legal or not uh i'm going to wait till tom's case is over with and hear what the policy is i do not have any details on that whatsoever but uh realistically at this point in time because they can't make up their mind i had to do what i thought was morally right um because it's such a gray area that 
I followed my morals on this one. Uh, I did absolutely piss quite a few people off. The entomology world, I actually have quite a few friends with, and I have, uh, I really aggravated a couple of them uh, with me publicly announcing that I produce Celadonia because it is against the Lacey Act, and a lot of these entomologists follow their uh, permits and stuff to a T. Um, so, I don't know. It, it was like a, it was a choice of morality, I think, at that point, just because it was so gray area. But I will say, I did base a lot of my opinion off of a recording that I did here. Uh, it was with the Fish and Wildlife Service agent and the guy who is currently working with the policy, like there's multiple people writing it, but he is the main policy writer. And he said that uh, this was a year and a half ago, though, but that what it looks like is they're going to be grandfathering it in. I have not heard anything other than that. And like I said, that was a year and a half ago, but I'm sure the recording's still around. But yeah, I'm just kind of waiting for Tom's stuff to get over. It sucks. Tom don't want to be in the middle of this. You know, he just wanted, he wants what's best for the hobby. I have a lot of respect for Tom Patterson. I don't think this is, honestly, I think this is the, absolutely the dumbest thing and the dumbest person to go after for it. Uh, you want to talk about people who are legitimately smuggling animals. Like there are multiple, multiple people that do that, bring in crazy stuff, thousands of them. And then you're going to go after somebody who genuinely cares for the hobby. Somebody who genuinely is like the grandfather of the hobby here in the United States and like try to crap on him that way. I just thought it was really disgusting how the government did it that way but i really wish tom the best of luck with that and i will continue doing my thing with celadonia so. yeah yeah i mean he's he, tom is is one of probably the most respected uh breeders in the hobby like every, everybody knows tom patterson if, if you've been in the hobby for more than a few months i'm sure uh and and i'm i made the mistake uh, when i made that video on t celadonia by not reaching out to him directly and the reason i didn't and what I've explained to a few people is because, you know, in my past, I've I've had some run-ins uh, with with federal authorities and, uh, you know, law enforcement, and I was always instructed to never discuss an ongoing investigation or case like that was. So it I didn't even think about reaching out to him because I was like, well, I'll ask him, and he'll just say I can't say anything. And my lawyer has advised me not to talk about this, which I think would be a smart thing to do. Um, so that's why I talked to you and other people that I knew kind of, you know, uh, had that information probably like secondhand from him. Um, yeah. And Tom, uh, I, could, uh, I think it was good for Tom because that. everything was so public anyways, you know, like everything was out in the open. So I, I don't think there yeah. was a lot of hush hush. So that was really good. I think the Saldoni, I think and I was, was able to, good. yeah. And I was able to get a lot of, I mean, he had made a public statement that I was able to go to a website and see a quote from him. Like, well, there, there's his statement. Like I, I can use that. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a crappy situation. And I really, my belief is that they should be legal in the U S they should be grandfathered in. We should be able to breed them and sell them and keep them in the hobby. And, and I think it's, it's messed up that uh that there is even a gray area you know if they had been imported into this country without any problems like you, you can't like just go back on that you know what i mean it's like well, they're already here you know they just say no more imports grandfather it in we'll move on like dragging this out it it is ridiculous and you know i and i just wanted to kind of set the record straight there like i i am all for them being like i'm not knocking anybody that's doing what they got to do i just I think that a lot of, uh, I, I think what's important for us in the hobby, whether we're you know breeding and selling or making YouTube videos or whatever, is to try and um, you know appear as responsible as possible. You know what I mean? Like hobbyists in any pet trade, you catch a lot of crap. You know whether you get your you're breeding ball pythons or geckos or whatever, it, it a lot of people kind of see it us as the problem. You know where. We're the people that are are bringing are buying these pets that are in areas that uh, where they're you know starting to go become endangered. Um, you know we're we're breeding and we're we're trafficking, I guess, profiting, selling species that uh, you know it, it people don't really think of as pets. You know, so that it, like right off the bat, they're kind of like, whoa, that's weird. I don't know if I'm cool with that. You know, and then then when you bring in the endangered and um, you know threatened species aspect to it. I think there's people's initial reaction is they shouldn't be allowed to do that. And I think as a hobby, we got to 
we really got to put our best foot forward and say like we are we we love these animals you know we're we're trying to protect them we're trying to do what's best for them and i i think sometimes that can get lost uh just kind of in the shuffle of controversy i agree i'm like a i'm a more of a don't talk about it be about a person i like people to walk the walk and not talk the talk you know so like it's important to me uh the people that uh I don't know. It's important to me that we build a hobby based on integrity and character and like a hobby that's like based upon like these spiders and like what's right for them and not necessarily uh, what's best for us. I mean, I don't understand the whole trafficking brown boxing thing. Like there's enough importers and stuff doing stuff legally and whatnot. Like, like you said, I think a lot of people have a problem with the overhead, but I also feel like a lot of people don't fully understand that. Um, yeah. I don't know, man. I just, I would rather see people do what's going to be beneficial for the hobby and respect it. Like, if you know something's wild caught and potentially could be smuggled, don't buy it. Like, you're that, that AVIC at the pet store that's overbred here in the hobby that's wild caught, you're not rescuing it. I'm sorry to tell you, like, you're legitimately, Ooh. like, seeing a product for somebody so that they can reinvest that money to get more and go out and do the same thing. Like, I mean, there's basic things that like people can do on a daily basis that will help that as well you know like the smuggling crap's kind of got to stop man like it, a lot more recently i've heard stories about the brown boxing and like random stuff just showing up selling i don't know man like it's just not smart it's not a way to re if you it's like poking somebody in the chest like Fish and Wildlife Services are already having issues with our, our hobby, you know? So let's go support the – this is being sarcastic, I mind you. Let's go support the vendors who obviously are smuggling so we can just keep poking that Fish and Wildlife Service in the chest. I'll just never understand it. Logically, to me, like, support the people who are ethically doing this for the right reasons. Like, there's no reason – okay, there's no reason that you need 80, 80 – wild caught species brought and sold for 50 bucks on your website of whatever like i don't know i just don't get it i'll never understand it but that's all part of the trafficking trade and like i said man it's all about the money to a lot of people i'm not really like the hobby a lot the, the money allows me in this business to support the business like the overhead of the business my employees all that jazz and be able to live at home to help take care of my dad and be able to provide to my breeding stock. You can literally ask me, ask anybody around me. I don't do anything else more than that. That's my hobby. This is a lot of people play around like selling spiders is their hobby or like, this is my life. Like it's not just selling spiders. Like even if I wasn't selling spiders, I wouldn't want to be attached to make you show to an education with them. Like, I don't know. They're, I think the world in this hobby sometimes has things screwed up and like intentions and stuff. I don't know. I just think differently than most people. I always try to step outside of the box and see where everybody else is coming from when I deal with the situation first. Yeah. It's, I mean, you're doing this as a, as a profession, you know what I mean? Like you're not just doing this, um, uh, to, to lose money, you know, you, you gotta break even. And, and if you're doing it full time, you gotta make enough money to pay your rent and pay your light bill. And you know what I mean? Have food to eat. And that's something I've railed against more than once on this podcast is this mindset that some people have that anybody doing anything in the tarantula hobby should be doing it at a loss, you know, or at least like you shouldn't be allowed to make any money because this is a hobby. This is fun. You know, whether you're like, like I catch heat sometimes uh, for ads on YouTube videos or for doing a, something sponsored. It's like this stuff's expensive. Like I got to uh, I'm losing money making YouTube videos and you know, people give, get all upset at dealers because they're, they're making a profit. And it's like, that's, that's how the world works though. Like you, if somebody wasn't able to make enough money to live, then nobody's going to be breeding tarantulas, but in all that hard work, like you're not doing it because it's, we're not getting rich off doing this stuff. That's for sure. Nobody's a millionaire, but it's one, it's that philosophy. If you do what you love, what you're passionate about, it's not really work. You know what I mean? Like you enjoy it and it's, it's fulfilling, you know, it's, you get to a, a point in life where it's more important to have a fulfilling experience than to just make a lot of money, you know? And that's, that's kind of where I'm at. There was some issues like how this whole T Celadonia controversy on my end started was because uh, people were posting, they had some for sale in my Facebook group. And I knew what the Facebook policy was on live animal sales and knew that 
and that there was controversy around that species. So I told uh, the moderators of the group, like, let's just, let's not touch that with a 10 foot pole. Like we're just not going to let people advertise that they have these for sale in our group. Cause I don't want to be, I don't want to be involved with anything that's happened until this stuff gets figured out. Yeah. And, and that it really upset some people. Um, but it's just that whole Facebook poll. And for people that don't know, I just kind of wanted to touch on the Facebook policy is, is unless you're a brick and mortar pet store, they don't allow you to sell live animals on Facebook. And it's always been the policy, but they just recently started enforcing it, especially in our, our community. Is, is, am I, am I right? Is that, do I have that under? No, you're absolutely right. So basically what I'm going to, so one of the things I have to do is get my company trademarked is because at that point in time, Facebook would consider me a brick and mortar store based on my circumstances with my dad. Now, typically they wouldn't allow that, but they're allowing me just because I get getting trademarked in it. I am also being a caregiver for my dad. So, uh, once that happens, they'll consider me a brick and mortar store. But up until then, yeah, anybody's page is at risk. And it's really bad, man, because when you do good, people hate for no reason. And like they, it just takes one time reporting somebody in somebody's whole business and whole life could be screwed up because somebody's spiteful or petty. Like it's just most of the time Facebook policy goes along with it as long as there's no issues. Instead of if there is an issue, instead of dealing with it, they don't because they don't have to. It's against their policy. So like my page, I didn't have a choice whether I got to uh, appeal it or not. Uh, it had taken so many hits. They're like, you're an issue, delete. I've never been able to get a hold of anybody over that since then. So, but yeah, you're right, 100% right. If you are if you do not have a brick and mortar pet store, you are liable to be, uh, be reported to Facebook and your whole business diminished. Peter pays Facebook a lot of money, 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 money. money. Yeah, getting uh, getting a trademark is like I had to get uh, the Tarantula Collective trademark, and that's that's a expensive and very long ordeal. Like it costs a lot of money for the, the trademark patent office, and then it takes almost a year just to get that taken taken care of. Yeah, it's gonna take a while. I heard it's not the easiest process, but uh, I don't know, man. I always feel like I've been very blessed in life to have like the people around me. I do when my dad was with it when he was. Uh, diagnosed with frontal lobe dementia he worked at like one of the number of more law firms in st louis so they like handled it for him in two weeks man like he was on his disability within two weeks of being diagnosed because they had to let him go because of it but uh so i've been very lucky and have been able to legally be able to do all my paperwork and filing and stuff and i have an attorney who's done everything for me pro bono so uh it's just like a way of him saying thank you for what my dad has done very cool. So do you do a lot of importing or do you mainly just do breeding? Okay, so I do importing. Uh, I'm going to do another one December 1st is when it's going to be coming in. Uh, but I have to be honest, I love piggybacking. So there's a lot of paperwork to importing. I don't think people really realize too. A lot of like headache, hassle with here and there because usually they're co it's coming from a broker. And it's not that one broker doesn't have what you're looking for. So you have to go around to all these different breeders over in whatever area you're importing from and have all these spiders shipped to one location so that this broker can export it for you. And then you import oh, it. Hold, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Let's stop right there. Uh, so there's somebody out there whose job, they're just a tarantula broker, like a stock broker or something like that. Like yeah, it's just... a tarantula broker, actually. Uh, yeah. He's a great guy. A lot of people know him. I don't want to give his name out there just because oh, I don't. Oh, they don't put him on blast. Okay, yeah, because I don't know if he wants his business out there like that or not. But yeah, he's in he's in Germany and he's a great dude. A lot of people who deal with like uh, the Europeans and stuff know him. He has a great reputation. But yeah, no, he he has a full time job, but he, his other part time job is basically a tarantula broker. I would call it ish. But he's the guy who I would go through to get my. I use a broker too, typically. So I like to use a broker that's actually in Canada. So what I do is have, because he imports for other people's stuff too, like reptiles and whatnot from the UK. So I usually just hop on his import and have him broker it in for my broker. So, and then at that point, it would cross from yeah. Canada and he would drive it across and go through customs, like on, by a car. And then when he goes through customs, that's when they distribute it out to New York and then they 
post it. Because when you export, if you don't have a broker, it ends up in a hub or even you sometimes. It ends up in a port and you have to pick up your import from a port. And I don't do that. I, I don't have access to I'm in the middle of the country. I would have to travel nine hours to well, Chicago's the closest one. But yeah, it's just not worth it. It's easier just to have uh, somebody literally it's easier to have a broker do it all for you. you basically pay somebody else to do it. That's another overhead right there, you know. Yeah, I I've seen some uh like talking to Tanya from Fear Not, sometimes when they have imports come in, they've got to drive to uh, Washington DC or somewhere like that, you know, to to pick up that huge box. But I think that's an aspect of dealing that a lot of us don't know about. Yeah. I don't know how she does it. Like she has, tw she very, Tanya's amazing, man. She did invite me in on her last import. She just got in a few days ago. Uh, she's an amazing person, but I don't know how she does it. 12,000 spiders is a lot of spiders. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, I'm like sitting here like 2000s a lot. I'm like, she must be just, crazy i don't know i love her to death though. she's an amazing human being i know like if you when you're dealing with exporting i mean you're and in, and in, in importing and i don't know about the tarantula hobby but i know like antiques and coins and stuff like that like i know uh like you know they, where i work my day job uh the guy that owns the business went to belarus and bought some coins there just like at a pawn shop or something like that. Cause it's, and they weren't even like really valuable. It was just like, Hey, these are some cool coins and we're in the coin. Like, it'd be cool to have some coins to put in our collection, show people. And he got, he got held up when he was leaving the country. Like they are like threw him into a holding cell for 12 hours because they're like, you don't have the proper paperwork to take this out of the country. And he's like, what? <laughs> like, it's not like I have some ten thousand dollar coin here. Like this is, this is no, crazy. for sure. Fish and wildlife, but, like fish and game are really particular on that too. Like, they'll make you wait eight hours, no problems. Like, they'll have you, ex when it comes into the country, when you get to the port, they'll go through your box. They don't care that it's going to take eight hours. They will sit and go through your whole, whole thing. And to be honest, 95% of the time, you're going to get searched. Like, it's just how it is nowadays. So, you always got to plan accordingly. When you're importing in something, it's not usually just a single-day process. You usually have to travel to get it and then they search it and then they give an approval. Yeah. I mean, just the whole process of finding people that have the species outside of the country, getting all of those species into one location for a broker. And then when you're doing that, we're talking, a, we're talking like a lot of money, you know what I mean? These are thousands, tens of thousands of dollars that is changing hands internationally. So now you've got exchange rates, you've got bank fees, you more than likely when we were talking about that much money and, and stuff like that, then, then there's also insurance and lawyers <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a lot is coming into play here. And then there's always a risk that it'll get confiscated or they'll die or, you know, there's all, there's a lot of other overhead risk. Then you get that import in and then you have to unpack them, rehouse them, feed them, photograph them, list them for sale, uh, promote them, then sell them <laughs> and then pack, repack them again, ship them off to an individual like that. That's a lot of work for one, like for just for anybody to do. Like, so what I'm asking you is, uh, what happened to you as a child? Why did you bring this on yourself? <laughs> Man, uh, yeah, I don't know. So to be honest, uh, <clears throat> I've always loved animals. I kind of figured out I'd be working in animals. I dropped out of high school when I was 16, uh, got my GED and started college. I went to school for youth ministry and Christian theology. And <clears throat> after that, well, during that process, I ended up becoming a licensed body piercer and piercing. Uh, during that time, I also got into the reptile hobby. Wait, well, stop right there. Man. Yeah, we'll it's stop. a lot, bro. So you went to school. You went to school. You pretty much went to seminary. You were going to become a youth minister. And, and you just kind of like skated over the fact that I went to college to become a youth minister and then became a body piercer. Like, how do you go from one end of the spectrum to the other? Well, the guy, my campus minister at the time was, a, he was like, as long as you, yeah, it was a very interesting conversation with the church leaders at the time too, but uh, no, they allowed me to do it. And then, uh, yeah, so I went to, I was, went to Lindenwood University for youth ministry, Christian theology. And then uh, after that, I was a part and active in the church for a very long time, but I did piercing up until two and a half years ago during that time. I actually left the church a long time ago. I really love theology. My whole family, my sister's a pastor of a mega church. My uh, dad has been a pastor and involved in church his whole life. My brother's a youth pastor. Uh, so it 
realistically, let's get on the real here. I went to school for marine biology. I couldn't pass chemistry. I needed to graduate real fast, and that was the easiest <laughs> way to get it done. There we so, go. Now, I don't know what kind of hippie uh, Christian denomination you're a part of out there in Missouri, but here in West Virginia, it's Southern Baptist, and you don't get tattoos, and you don't get piercings, and anybody that does that, they're demonic. Yeah, so my dad's actually a retired Southern Baptist preacher, so that's what's really <laughs> funny. But uh, I was not denominational when it came to that. But uh, to be honest, I I left the church a long time ago. I am a very moral person, and I believe in morals and ethics and integrity and character. And uh, I believe that spirituality is individual, and uh, I. I really liked that I was able to have piercing to rely on back on when religion wasn't there for me. So when piercing wasn't there for me, I was lost, man. I had no idea. I just knew like I wanted to pierce for 10 years and I was hitting like a a 13 year point uh, that I didn't want to be in. So uh, once I retired, I was like, where do I go now? And I was already very heavily involved in the reptile hobby. And I was like, I have like 300 spiders and I'm selling quite a few right now. Like maybe I could turn this into a thing. So I actually did not start my business when I wanted to. Uh, I started a different company called Midwest Munchies. It was selling like feeder insects and tarantulas. And that business, I realized I didn't know what the heck I was talking about when it came to tarantulas. Okay. So uh, I cut off my business and I went and took five years to learn and study and just grow in the hobby. Uh, a lot of Tom Patterson, oh my God, dude, Tom Patterson deserves a million bucks for the, the questions I've asked him. A lot of Tiffany from Kansas State University, Ruth, just the whole hobby in general. I took a, a more uh, a more of an approach of not trying to make any money off of it instead of just learning what I'm talking about. So during that time, I researched for about five years. And then two and a half years ago, I started Simply Spiders on August 21st. And it was like, I don't know, that was a month out of piercing. And I was like, I can do this. And I had no business experience other than being a piercer uh, doing it. And I just was like, when I started this business, I made a rule to everybody involved. I was like, if it's not going to get done right, I don't want it done at all. And, like, I've always really stood by that when it comes to this. And, like, I want people to be treated fairly. And I want more person more important than another person to me. So, uh, to be honest, everybody's less important to me than these spiders are. So, uh, yeah. if these spiders aren't being taken care of, those are going to be my number one. And then people come second. So, and I had recently, actually, ironically, just realized something because I just had a conversation a few uh, minutes ago before we started this with somebody and i think i'm like being a hypocrite right now so uh <laughs> but i'll have to go deal with that later but realistically yeah. like uh when you get caught up in the life of business you kind of forget sometimes like how how cool it is to be able to sit here and be surrounded by this you know and like uh, sometimes I lose focus on my animals and I'm lucky that Derek's around the like reset my focus sometimes yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. I, I have a similar kind of story. I, I was raised Southern Baptist, um, very, very devout, uh, strict family. And I actually went to college in uh, South Dakota. It was a, a private Lutheran school. And it, essentially my, my uh, goal in life was to become a Southern Baptist minister. Like that was, my sister was going to be a missionary and I was going to be a, a preacher. And, uh, it, and they were really upset that I didn't go to a Southern Baptist seminary, like in Tennessee, that I, I chose to do a Lutheran school. And like the main reason I, I went to a Lutheran college was because one, they gave me a full ride and two, it was like the furthest away from my home that like that was, uh, they accepted me and they were like 24 hours away. So I was like, that's where I want to go. I want to get as far away from this town as possible. And, you know, I just, I had been raised in such a strict environment. I just wanted that freedom. And I got out there and realized pretty quickly that, um, that wasn't my, that wasn't my path. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it wasn't a seminary. It was just a, a, like, it was a liberal arts school. So it was just a bunch of, you know, English majors and music majors and stuff like that. And, you know, I kind of like, I had that, that ability to kind of, like, I went out there to be a, with the plan of becoming a Southern Baptist minister. I left there an assistant manager at Hot Topic. So that tells you what happened in that time frame, you know, and then, you know, like my, my twenties were just kind of a blur of, um, 
wild and crazy experiences. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's kind of funny to think, just to see the, the path life takes. Like I knew f- that the, the church was going to be my life and now look at my life now, you know, like uh, living in a town I never ever thought I would live in and married and have kids and stepkids and a, and a, uh, have a granddaughter now and, a basement full of spiders making YouTube videos and taking pictures, you know, talking to people like you. And it's, uh, it, I, I never envisioned this and I think it, it's very cool, but I, I think that what you were talking about earlier, like you don't have to be religious to be spiritual and you know, there's a whole spiritual path, you know, a whole space out there that's free from, you know, any kind of like church oversight or whatever. But yeah, there, there's, there's a whole, there's a whole realm of, uh, there, there's ways to be moral and, and, have a spiritual life that doesn't require you uh to necessarily be religious and i think that finding that path and th- th- and I-, I mentioned this in one of my previous podcasts is that i i there's a lot of spirituality for me just in keeping tarantulas you know like there's a lot of lessons that i can learn uh there's a lot of i don't know it's just the act of caring for something you know that the majority of, of society thinks is terrifying and disgusting like there's there's something rewarding in that. I I just wanted to touch back on on what you had mentioned about you know treating everybody with respect and no matter who they are and you know male female gay straight red blue whatever it is I think that's something that we lack a lot in this hobby especially new beginners and experienced beginners and that's something I really that's what it's a main goal of the Tarantula Collective especially like the Facebook group is to have a space where you know new people aren't going to be ridiculed just for not knowing, you know, I think that's, that's for the hobby to grow and, and for everybody to, you know, benefit, you know, for the, for the, not just people, but tarantulas as well. Like we, we all need to have this free and open exchange of information and we got to be respectful of each other when we do that. I don't think people think like deeper into that situation, honestly, when they're dealing with like new people to the hobby and whatnot. Okay. So you're a vendor and you're trying to sell, your your product or whatever okay for anything that you do business wise okay why would you treat somebody who's interested in getting into your business in a manner other than with respect like one thing i give respect until you show me you do, don't deserve it so like anybody that's brand new i want you to to hit me up i want you to feel like i I'm teaching you correct information and stuff. Like I want people to have the right stuff because in the long run, they're the ones that are supporting your business. I'll never understand people like just because you think it's a dumb question doesn't mean it's not a, or it's not a legit question. Like in, I love your group, man. Like I really do a whole lot. Like your group is one that I try to post in as much as I can, but uh, because of how I had my business, I couldn't. So, uh, but I try to post in there a lot because like, you guys don't put up with that. Like you don't to put up with degrading people who don't know, or even if it's a stupid question, like what we would see as stupid, isn't stupid to the 50 people who really wanted to know that, but didn't have the nerve enough to ask because people are getting ridiculed for it. in these other groups, like yeah. I'll never understand that. I try to bring people into my business so that they know. I can't let anybody say anything nice about the tarantula collective group and take that compliment on myself because I'm just, I just have ideas. You know what I mean? I'm like, I, this is what I want to create. This is the environment I, th- I think is important to have available to people. It's people like Tanya Higgins and, and Kylie Banson and uh, I mean, the, the whole team of admins and moderators. They're the ones that actually create that environment. You know what I mean? I'm just, I'm just the idea, man. They're the ones that are doing the hard work and moderating the group. And, and I, I wish I could pay them a full-time salary for doing what they do. Oh, uh, Hans, like a lot of your admins order from me on a regular basis and stuff. Like they're incredible yeah. people. And like, uh, I'm very, very honored uh, on the Facebook page or uh, our business page. We had three recommended uh, like educational platforms. And like, I really have a, I really wanted to have the people who are on this list of like recommended vendors and stuff like be people who I truly respect in the area that I'm telling people that they are because there is nothing in this world I have other than my name and what I say, you know? So like if I, uh, for these people, I want them to be people that people can trust. And I feel like your, your, your website and your Facebook group is a great platform for beginners because 
the admin team doesn't allow like the cyber bullying or whatever people people are like oh they need to be grown-ups and no you just need to learn to respect people like there's a a common courtesy level of respect like i came from not knowing a single thing about a spider like grandma stole a what like i yeah. i knew nothing to where i am today and like if people treated me that way back then i wouldn't be in this hobby like it's disgusting some like the way some people talk to like some of these hobbyists like i i don't know it's not how i surround myself with good people and so i always say this i only surround myself with good people in the second that i see that you're not a good person like i have no problem cutting that tie like uh, a lot of people have a problem with <clears throat> if I cut ties with them business wise, that just means like I absolutely hate them or whatever. It's just no, I just don't like your business practices. I think a lot of different things go into different variables, but respect is something you should always have for somebody until they prove otherwise, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I was taught this many years ago, but uh, it, it was, I was having this issue in my personal life with uh, people didn't trust me but they didn't trust me because I was hanging out with a lot of people that were very untrustworthy, you know? And someone explained to me, like, you're like a crystal and whatever the color of the table is that you set that, that clear crystal on, that's the color it's going to look. So if you're hanging out with untrust, exactly. It's like you're, you're taking on those qualities. Even if you are a good person and you're very trustworthy, if you surround yourself with bad people that aren't trustworthy, everybody's going to assume that you're a bad person and you're not trustworthy. Man, let me tell you, I think a lot of people get a false uh, concept of me, like that I like in this, I don't know, I'm just this big dork, like I, like I feel like I'm on Ellen right now or something, like people don't understand, like I'm just an average dude and I make so many mistakes, but the important key is like I got good people around me, so when I do make those mistakes, they call me out on it and I'm able to correct those if I feel necessary, you know? And like a lot of people have given me many chances and stuff. Like it's a respect thing. And I truly feel like in these groups, if you feel like you need to belittle somebody or troll somebody, like that's a character issue on your behalf. And like, you should probably take yourself outside of that situation and look at how you would have felt if you were treated that way. Cause man, I don't put up with like bullies. I don't, that's not my cup of tea. And I'm a very, very opinionated person and very public with my opinion. So uh, I just, I don't, I don't allow disrespect. I don't feel anybody deserves to, be, to, to disrespect me or people I care about. That is one way of being just done with me is disrespect me or somebody I care about. I have no issues saying bye. Yeah. I mean, I'm totally cool with people holding you accountable. Like if I'm doing, if I'm acting out of character or I'm doing something that's not cool and somebody wants to call me out on that, that's, that's completely cool. Even if I just say something that's wrong and people want to correct me and call me out, that's cool. Uh, I, it's uncomfortable. I don't like ever being wrong about any, just ask my wife, you know, like I have a hard time, uh, uh coming to terms sometimes when, when I'm wrong, but I, eventually I do. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I'm wrong. You know, it's, but you need people like that in your life to hold you accountable. Everybody here in my business will tell you it takes me one hour. They will tell me something, and I'm a, uh, I be, I'm a very emotional person. For a dude, it's very weird because I'm extremely emotional. But, man, I will just go nuts for an hour, and then after that hour, like, everything's chill and everything's cool. But, like, realistically, uh, I don't know, man. There's a lot that in this hobby wasn't the same way that it was 10 years ago. And like the disrespect is one of the things that uh, I think has definitely affected the hobby in a negative light. Uh, back when I first started, this was a secret. I don't think people realize like they expect information freely. And that's not how that was when I started. You had to like apprenticeship with somebody almost like, the breeders kept everything to themselves. Like nobody talked about how to breed these spiders or what it takes or anything. Like you literally had to get to know somebody to be able to get that information, you know, and like that also built me and Ruth's friendship. And I don't know. I think a lot of people have an entitlement nowadays and that's where that respect issue and the bullying comes in. I just wish everybody would take a second and appreciate the new people that are coming into their hob the hobby because man, they're going to be the ones that save this in the long run. Not us breeders. We're doing what we know best how to do. It's the people that are coming into this hobby right now that are purchasing these spiders that are going to be able to rely on the few further generations of these spiders to accommodate to 
the next generation's needs and the next generation's needs. Like, stop crapping on good people for no reason. Just because they're new, it doesn't make sense to me. I'll just, again, you are who you hang around. So I encourage everybody to hang around positive people. Yeah. And that, that was, that's home. That's my stand, I guess, uh, in a lot of ways. That's, that's what, what I find to be very important is, you know, you got to respect new people like like you were just saying because they're the future but it's also like i understand i think a lot of it is you know kind of like i like spiders before they were cool i kept tarantulas before they were cool or something like that you know it's like this you have this uh it's gaining in popularity and people are that i don't know it's to me somebody being a bully or being a jerk to somebody else online that's asking a question uh i just want to look at the camera when i say this it all that is showing is your own personal insecurity like when you're acting that way online you know, you're just, you're not, you're not looking cool. You're not being a badass. You're just proving to me how insecure you are about yourself. And I think that's something that, you know, maybe you don't realize, but it's, uh, I, I think what I struggle with is I know a lot of the people that give me shit online If they saw me face to face. They wouldn't say that to my face. You know, like I have no respect for anything you say negative about me. If you couldn't say it to my face. And I've, I've realized that a lot recently, not so much recently, but when I, I caught a lot of flack. Uh, or making YouTube videos and starting this group and stuff like that early on. Some of it was my own fault, like just situations I got myself into. But it, the people that were my biggest trolls online, like the people that were my biggest trolls online, I've met them in person at Tinley or, you know, somewhere else, and they didn't have shit to say. You know what I mean? I was like, so all that barking was for nothing. Like, now you want to shake my hand to be friends. Like, that's cool. We can be friends. But just know from here on out, anything you're you're barking about online, I, I'm not going to pay. I'm not going to put any stock because yeah. I know you're. Yeah, you know, that's what I'm saying. You're, that you're talk just, the talk, but not walk the walk thing. Like I, yeah, I don't know. Like you can sit there and belittle these like newcomers into the hobby, but you're not walking the walk. You're just talking the talk by belittling them. Walking the walk would be helping them and showing them the right way of how to do things. You know, and like man, I feel you. You get this more than I think uh, a lot of people do because of your platform and your name. Uh, but there's so many haters out there for no reason. Like, yeah. guys, you got better things to do with your time because I know I do. But like, yeah. I just realistically <laughs> don't understand why, like, how, how many, how so many people can just hate. Like, a lot of the things that people hate on you about is your opinion. Like, yeah. it's your opinion. You're entitled. <laughs> opinion man like your opinion yeah. and then like for some reason because you say it or i say it it's the end all be all no yeah. like like i said we're just normal guys dude you have a family i have mine I'm taking care of my dad running this thing like people right. like think like oh it's like this paradise of spiders and no it's just like living life and having the extra stress of two thousand spiders on top of it exactly and I, I try to say that as many times as i can like i'm not telling anybody what to do you that's your journey you gotta you gotta take that walk yourself all i'm doing is telling you what i do maybe you can use some of my experiences to help guide you you know but i'm not telling you what to do i'm not saying this is the only way to do it this is the be all end all information i'm still learning you know like the more i learn about tarantulas the more i realize i don't know shit about tarantulas you know i, I really i'm constantly learning more and I'm just trying to relay some of my lessons or, you know, like lessons I've learned to, so that maybe you don't have to learn that lesson the hard way like I did, you know, or maybe you can benefit from my experience. But, you know, and then some of it's just opinions. Like, it's just what I think. And the the funny thing is, like, I, I kind of started this uh, with that idea that uh, if I don't want if I don't want any hate, if I don't want any haters or I don't want any controversy, then I'm not going to do anything different. You know, I could I could just be another uh, it, just do it. Just, just copycat another YouTuber, not have any opinions or, or try to stay out. Of, you know what I mean? Like there's, I wanted to do something different with my Facebook group and I wanted to do something different with my YouTube channel. And with that knowledge, I knew there's, I'm going to catch a lot of flack. I'm going to have haters, especially like uh, the people that have been in the hobby for a while. They're going to be like, how dare you tell us not to, that we can't be rude to newcomers or, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's inevitable. So I was ready for it, but it still sucks. Like there's a lot of, messages i just don't read i'm like yeah it's from that guy I, i'm not even gonna bother with it like i don't need that negativity in my life i blocked a bunch of people like just because i was like you you have nothing positive to add to anything i'm doing if you just want to complain and bitch then i'm, I'm just gonna block i've that done that a, for a lot life. recently yeah I, I really have like uh i'm very lucky though a lot of people think that uh 
like when they report me or something, they're directly affecting me or whatever. But in the ways like people that are mean or hateful to me, usually people send me it or let me know that people are talking about me or whatever. 99% of the time, I'm just like, yeah, that's just what people seem to do nowadays, you know? But the crappy part is like, I really genuinely care about people and it really sucks. It really does like hit hard when like people just consistently, uh, crap on your hopes and dreams and do whatever they can to literally have a vendetta against you for for spiders man like nothing else and like it's uh i don't know i just told myself a long time ago i don't want to be one of those people in this hobby i've dealt with a lot of uh a lot of interesting characters over the years in this hobby and like i have to admit there was a time where a good chunk of them were not solid individuals, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I just never wanted to be like that. I started this company to base it off of what I saw was missing in the hobby when I was there. And like, like I said, you had to grow in this hobby and you had to learn from people who would teach you. I always wanted to be somebody who would be willing to teach people because that gift was given to me by Ruth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to make sure publicly that I never held anything back from the public. If it was going to benefit the spiders and the general public, then that's what I was going to do. So that's why it is important to me that we focus on like the people that are in this hobby, because like it's the right thing to do and people aren't used to doing the right thing anymore. Uh, I know we're in different situations. You know what I mean? Like you have a business that's selling spiders and, you know, things like reviews and people reporting posts and stuff like that can have a financial impact on you. Um, it does. It things difficult. But it's the opposite for me. It's something that I, I get a kick out of. It's like, I, I, I can't even remember anybody's name. So I, I would love to call them out, put them on blast right now. But I just, I don't have that good of a memory and they're not that important. But there's there's a couple of people that just really hate me for whatever reason. And uh, they, they, uh, they would, they'll do things like, take clips from my videos and edit them all together and then like post them in all these tarantula groups and like making fun of me. And I'm like, that's the best type of, um, like I can't pay for that kind of advertising. Yeah. Like, it's free publicity, man. It's exactly. Like you really think you're hurting me by cutting it up and showing like, look at the high quality video this guy made. <laughs> it's like, yeah. hey, thank you. See, like people that. just recently, you know, I got banned from Facebook and all that jazz. But it happened the same way. Like, okay, you guys think you got one over on me, but in reality, you just forced me to build a website. Like, yeah. that helps me. Like, I would have never <laughs> done that if you wouldn't have just reported my stuff. I don't know. Again, it's taking a step outside of the box. And I think in the hobby, as a general whole, if everybody just learned to do that, I think a lot of the the issues and drama that happened and all that would not even be a situation like Treat people the way you want to be treated. It's like an old concept, but it is. I mean, we can yeah. we can still keep it applied here, you know. Yeah, just because we're online doesn't. It's a virtual space. It doesn't mean we still, you know, we're somehow excused from treating people like human beings. Yeah, people treat like online it's... like that's a whole separate world, and I'm cool with that. You do whatever you want to do, okay? But I am who I am online. The person you see online is the same person I am to Jess or Bubba or Derek or Scott or Aaron or you or <laughs> Tanya Stewart or like, I don't get this whole like keyboard warrior. I don't know. I wouldn't say anything online that I haven't already said to you personally. And a lot of people don't yeah. like hearing the truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I'm, I'm a little bit different. Um, I, I am a little bit different online than I'm in real life. Like there's a lot of things I would say to your face that I won't say online just because I'm like, yeah, that doesn't need to be public. But when I see you in person, I'm, I'm going to tell you exactly what I think about you. My, but I also have a, a wife that moderates my content. You know what I mean? I post stuff and she's like, you need to take that off Facebook. That's too dark. And I'm like, oh, come on. It's hilarious. She's like, no, we, we have, we have a, we have a community. You know what I mean? Like our kid goes to school with some people that, you know, friends with on Facebook, they don't need to know that aspect of your personality. I'm like, I feel like sometimes people's perception of me online is a little sugar coated. Like I think I'm, I'm a, a little darker of a much darker sense of humor than sometimes it, it, it sneaks out in my videos and stuff. And people will leave a comment like, dude, that was, that's messed up. Do you realize what see you next Tuesday spells? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's why it's funny. <laughs> Glad it took you almost a year and a half to catch on. <laughs> right. I love it. 
It was, uh, I don't know, man, I have to admit, I think your presence online is awesome. The thing is, like, I sell tarantulas. You get me with that, okay? So I'm not, I, I don't have to sugarcoat anything on that. End. But you're selling yourself, you know, and, like, realistically, you're a, you're somebody who has a, uh, a massive following over the fact of your hobby and your passion. And, like, I don't care who anybody is. That's commendable to me, like, uh, to be able to have a platform that you have and express your opinions and your passions to um, the hobbyist is gangster level to me, man. Like, I think that's fantastic. And I think that you should be very proud of yourself for where you are and the haters are always going to hate. So, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, it's, sometimes I forget. It's not until I go somewhere like Tinley and people are nervous meeting me. And I'm like, dude, why are you nervous? I, I'm a, I'm a dude that hangs out in this basement, takes pictures of spiders. Like, I'm not right. <laughs> But it's, uh, it cracks me up, but it's, um, there's my whole goal, like from day one to right now and going in the future is I just want to share my love of tarantulas and my love of the hobby, my love of snakes and scorpions. And people get mad because I'm making videos about scorpions. I'm like, I understand that this is the tarantula collective and you started watching because, but it's about, it's, it's, it's about what I like and what I have. And, and there's a lot, a lot of, it's about you. People want to see you. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta tell you what I'm, I'm passionate about. Like, I got, I'm not gonna make, video, you know, if I'm really excited about something, I'm not gonna just hide it away because oh, a couple of people might not like it. Like, I'm just trying to be real. Like, this is what's going on in my life. If I'm dealing with a lot of scorpion stuff, then there's probably gonna be a lot of scorpion videos. If I'm dealing with a lot of snake stuff, there'll be some snake videos. Like, I just, just whatever's happening. And, uh, but it's the, the whole purpose, the whole reason I even started making YouTube videos or started uh, you, uh, Facebook group was to try and help people and, and to, to elevate or not elevate. That's not the right word, but just to try and grow, do what I can to kind of grow the hobby and bring it to more people. You know, I'm not making videos for people that have been in the tarantula hobby for 20 years. I'm not the, the elite people. If you like them and you want to watch, thanks. That's awesome. I appreciate the support. I'm making videos for the people that have never considered having a tarantula before, you know, like I don't sell tarantulas. Uh, and sometimes I think maybe I should, because I feel like I'm making sexy car commercials for tarantula species, but it's like, I don't want to do that. But that's, that's my whole goal is, is almost like converting people. You know what I mean? Like somebody that's into snakes be like, Oh wow. I, I never saw a tarantula in this light before. Somebody just told me where it came from and how to take care of it with really good photos and videos that, that makes it very appealing. And I, it's like, I'm just trying to spread the word. I guess in a way I did become a minister instead of like Southern Baptist dogma. I'm, I'm preaching tarantulas, you know, but that's my goal. <laughs> I think it's really cool because like, I try to not look at who I actually am as a person a whole lot as in like, Oh, I'm Dustin Blood is the owner of simply spiders. And I have this platform that I can use for this and that and this and that, but I'm more so just here with the spiders and like, I'm just glad that like, people like you are in the hobby that can educate and like, so that I can continue doing what I love for the customers that need the help. Like I can't tell you how many times I've sent people over to your channel just to get a little bit of information because I'm dealing with 30 other people. Like, and uh, I don't know. I just, I want the hobby to be like a hobby where people don't have to worry about being scammed. And like, there's, there's a, it's based on integrity. It's based on like a passion, a love. And like, that's why people, do it you know like i can tell you about how many times it's probably as many times as i've sent people to you that are asking me hey where can i get this tarantula i'm like check out simply spiders <laughs> you know what i mean i know he has some in stock but it's that's like the cooperative kind of i think that's what makes our community strong and what if we worked on it, could make it a lot stronger is if instead of like it always being a competition you know whether it's competition between youtubers or competitions between dealers or uh some kind of like you know competition in between you you know what i mean like there's if we all we're working together to kind of help each other. You know what I mean? Like I send, I, I'm a big supporter of anybody that's breeding tarantulas responsibly and selling them. Anybody that's like, like tarantula cribs making awesome enclosures, you know, I'm a big supporter of them. Uh, uh, it's, I, I think that the, a rising tide rise raises all ships. You know what I mean? Like the better videos I can make and get people in, interested in the hobby, the more people come into the hobby, the more tarantulas you're going to be selling. And the more tarantulas you're selling, the more tarantulas you'll be able to, to bring in and breed and the more species will be available for people that are keeping tarantulas and the more species that are available for people keeping tarantulas, you know, it, it, the more people are going to be wanting to buy enclosures. You know what I mean? Like it's all 
interconnected. And the, and and the, the market value of spiders will go down too. Like people do complain a lot that it, that spiders are overpriced, but yeah, that's true. There's a, there's a lot of demand right now for spiders. I mean, a lot right. of demand, but if they could just, if we can get a consistent breeding program, like my whole company was based on like, breeding to the point where we can sustain ourselves here in the united states where we don't need to rely on you the uk and over time breeding has definitely became more and more of a thing for people and i think eventually we'll probably get there but like people don't realize like we can do this ourselves like don't all the love for my people overseas like you know but realistically <laughs> if we did this right like we wouldn't have to rely on them for the species we have here and stuff and like that is my biggest hope for the hobby is that we get to a point where it's like that because man i didn't realize i liked spiders until i was like 18 okay or 21 21 or something like that. i don't even know how long but uh i didn't even know i liked them until then and like i can only hope that the future and generation that there is somebody like me that will continue on the legacy that i want to leave for the hobby and, and all i want to know to be in this hobby is like a cool dude that like really loved the spiders and like made sure that everybody got their dream creatures that they yeah. could. Like I hope one day that this hobby is a lot like leopard geckos or ball pythons. It's just as popular. You know what I mean? Like that's my goal. I think that it's very, and I think it's 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 starting to head that way. Not because of it of just what I'm doing. Like I think it, as a as a whole, there's a lot of people out there doing a lot to kind of raise awareness and, and just, like, just in st louis cool alone thing. well like go back way from the beginning of this just in st louis alone i know within an hour and a half of here i know nine tarantula breeders so that tells you from five years ago there were two two oh, wow. there's nine that consistently breed on a regular basis and we there's all nine of us except one or two two of them nine people all work together so seven of us yeah. all work together in that instance like Very it's cool. to build a hobby man like other people have their own intentions and that's cool but when you get a group of people which is the majority of the hobby that all have an intention of seeing the hobby flourish and do good that's the group of people that you want to focus on but we again we always are going to have those people that are bad for the hobby and still trafficking and stuff like that your best bet to do for the hobby is don't purchase for those people ethically because they're doing wrong stuff yeah that's a dope spider i want it too but i'm not gonna buy it because it came here like yeah i don't know like mm -hmm. people can keep whatever they want and whatnot i have no problem with that but there's just some things you need to learn to keep public or keep out of the eye of the public whether and it's just about money when somebody does that then you see their intentions as pure money you know it's not the benefit of the hobby at that point it's the benefit of your pocketbook yeah i mean I'm, I'm never one to shame someone for trying to make a buck like get your hustle on do what you gotta do but if you're doing something that's unethical to to do that that's that's where i draw the line you know what i mean like that's you know if if you're being exploitive you know to you know making videos exploiting your tarantulas and and, and just stressing them out and harming them and doing stuff like that just so you're getting views and getting ad revenue i'm not cool with that but if you're, you know, being a responsible keeper and you got ads on your YouTube videos so you can make a few bucks, I got no issue with that. And I will never shame somebody for for a lot that. of the majority of my people on my website for recommended vendors is actually uh, breeders and stuff. Like a lot of these breeders are great people, man. And like a lot of people won't give them the opportunity because they're ordering through larger companies. Some of these breeders have a passion just as big as mine. They just haven't had the opportunity yet, you know, and I'm really excited to see what this hobby is going to be like in the next 10 years, just based upon and how much it's changed in the past five, you know? Yeah. And I might piss some people off with this statement and uh, I'm saying it to you um, because I think it, you would, you're somebody that would have a different perspective on it, but it seems like there's a lot of people out there. And I mean, and I've been seeing this for five years, over five years now, they, they get into tarantulas. They, they're, you know, they get addicted. I'm just going to say that you're addicted to tarantulas. You started with one, then you went to 20 and then you went to a hundred. Now you got 200 and you're breeding them and you have this idea, like, I'm going to start a, like, instead of just breeding them and wholesaling them to dealers that can then sell them that, are, you know, they, they decide I'm going to start my own business. And then you have like all these like little businesses that pop up and they're around for about six months and then they rip a bunch of people off and disappear, you know, cause they have like a bunch of shipments go bad or they have an import coming in that gets confiscated. And they just keep all the money. And it's like, I feel like we should, I'm and not saying not, 
not discouraging anyone from starting their own business. I think that's awesome. But I think there should be some encouragement of people to just breed for the sake of, you know, wholesaling them to, to dealers. I agree a billion percent with you on this only because uh, both of my, two of my employees, so well, three, Jess and Bubba, they have a wholesale company. They can't work for me and have a competing business with against me. They've always wanted to focus on wholesale and so has Derek. Now, it would, I don't think people realize the um, that's where it comes over to that overhead again that we we're talking about, how much effort and energy and, and my resources it takes to take care of all these animals. Like, so I always hear people say, oh, I want to do what you do. It's going to be a dream. It's going to be the best thing. It's like paradise or whatever. And I'm literally look, literally on the phone with Jess like, oh my God, this can't, we had an import go wrong. What? How long ago? I don't know. A like, ago. Yeah, a couple months ago. It went horribly wrong. Like horribly wrong. It was a $6,000 import. 4K of that stuff did not even show up. Like it was absolutely crazy. And uh, yeah, I can see how it gets discouraging. You know, I not only lost 4K, but I also lost, I lost a lot of money. I lost around like 12 grand. Okay. So with that, on just on that 12 grand, you hear that on one order I lost. Like, and then like the crazy thing was, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to be able to fix this right now. And you know what? I relied on the hobby. I just was open with people with honesty. Like the honesty is missing out of this hobby. I was just like, look, yeah. I got screwed. We all got screwed. Here's how I'm going to make it right with everyone. And I ended up making it right with every single person. It took about a week. It took about a week. Like it wasn't no big deal. Now one person out of 24 people made a issue out of it. I literally that night cried because I was just like, I got the best customers in the world because like, dude, we're talking 4K worth of spiders on an import list. That's a, a lot of spiders. We're talking like close to a hundred or something. So it just went bad and people don't, ex people think it's all sunshine and daydreams. And 90% of the time it's me with my head spinning around on my shoulders on the phone with one of my employees. Right. Yeah. Like I, I have no intention um, to ever become a dealer. I say that all the time because I get so many people asking me, this, like, how do I buy tarantulas from you? I'm like, you don't. Like, it's not something I uh, have any interest in doing at all. But I, I had this, just scorpions just won't stop having babies. <laughs> and it's like, you know, I, so my, I'm like, I'm going to wholesale them. You know, I, I have the babies. I'm going to give them to somebody that knows what they're doing and, and can market them and get them sold. And I've got uh, a couple breeding projects that I'm, I'm going to start working on in the near future just because I want the experience of breeding but I have no intention on selling them, you know, personally, you know, I'm, I, I'm going to wholesale them to somebody like you, uh, and, and be like, you guys handle it. <laughs> and, you know, and I wish that more people would do that. Like that, that if, you, if you're going to breed them, that's awesome. But if you don't have the time and the drive to start a business, like, yeah, you'll make a lot of money, a lot more money retailing them to people. But, uh, I think it, it really is an, it's an, it affects the hobby in general in neg a very negative way when somebody starts their own business to sell them and ends up not having what it takes and it comes crashing down and burning because people get, people get burnt and they lose money. They get scammed. They get ripped off. They feel like, uh, this isn't the hobby for me. I'm not dealing with tarantulas anymore. And I have to agree with you on that as well, man. Like even recently, a uh, larger name company had a lot of problems with an import. A lot of people got, uh, haven't even received their order, let alone don't know anything about it and won't get in contact. Even with that import, like a lot of people contacted me trying to get replacement items for what they ordered on that import through said company or whatever on a pre import. Word of warning don't pre import anything, guys. Just wait till it gets here in the country, okay? There are too many yeah. variables. I don't care who anybody tells you what, but this is the truth. There's too many variables, too many risks. Don't pre import, just wait till it's here. Second thing, but yeah, even with that company, man thousands thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of people's money is currently up in the air because there is no product there is not everything was i don't know there's a lot to go in that situation but that is the kind of stuff that prevents like newer people from the hobby trusting smaller individuals or even bigger name companies like my like like tanya or said company or us or whatever like it just yeah. doesn't make sense to me because like you're ruining that's what I'm saying. The good people in this hobby are real good, and the bad people ruin it for everyone, man. Like everyone. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, I, it's something I've said a lot, and I've caught some grief over it. I, 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 when people are talking about doing a pre-import order, um, you know, and because they're, they're saving so much money, they're like, it's like 30% cheaper if I do a pre-import. And I'm like, I understand that, but there's a lot of variables. that. Are, what if uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, decides to confiscate the, the, for whatever reason, they hold up the order? What if there's the plane crashes or it just gets lost? Like there's, there's so many things that could happen that could go real wrong real fast. It's not worth it. I would rather pay that extra 30% and know that guy's got it in hand and is going to give it to me. And that probably also comes from past experiences in life. You know, I was in some shady stuff and it was like, if, if one dude was like, Hey, I got what you want. It's a hundred bucks. And this other dude was like, well, I can, I can get it for you for 75, but you got to give me the money and let me run across town. It's like, yeah, I'll, right. I'll pay more. I'll pay more. <laughs> like, I don't trust you. <laughs> so it's like, that's that's how I do is with tarantulas. Like I, if if I got to pay a little bit more, and I would rather do that than than you know do a pre import. And I understand where people like you know dealers like you. I mean, not not so much you, but people that do the pre import sales. I understand they're trying to like get a whole bunch of money together uh, so that they can get a whole lot, maybe get it cheaper or whatever. It yeah, is. but that's like, also because they that like making that awesome. extra money. You don't have to support as a hobby. We do not have to support. Whoever's doing the imports, hobby for them, okay? There's only one person I've ever done a pre-import with that like, I fully trust, Joe Rossi. Every pre-import I've ever done with Joe Rossi has came perfect. I, same with Tanya. I've only ever done a couple of pre, like pre or import stuff with Tanya. Everything's always worked out. Pretty much everybody else, it just doesn't work out. So you don't, and the reason like these importers are like, Oh, come pre-import this and this because it's mon more money for them. It's it's all about the money, man. Like they're pre-importing because they get that money and then they can spend that money on whatever because they know that this is coming in as long as they're getting it from a trusted person. Like it's crazy to me that people still do the pre-imports. I will get. I will be honest, Joe Rossi. I think you're solid. Like I think he will totally rock it out for you on your import. I I don't know anybody else's case has never done me wrong, but. People will learn sooner than later. Don't do pre-imports, man. It's not good. I don't even offer pre-imports. And, and, like it's, and I'm not, I'm not like bashing any particular company. Like I know that uh, Fear Not Tarantulas has done pre-imports before, and like I trust Tanya implicitly. You know what I mean? Like she's one of the few people in this world that I would invite to my house that I have invited to my house. You know, it's like we're not related, even though we have the same last name, and people assume that we're a brother. I and thought you guys were married. Yeah. Like. I was like, dude, like, Richard I and that all the time. Just like, oh no, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard so like we're we're married, we're cousins, we're brother and sister. I'm like, we, we just happen to have the same last name. Like that's like many people. There's a lot of Stewarts out there. We're not all related. Uh, Everybody, all but, Stewarts are related. Yeah, and I caught a lot of grief. Like anytime there's any kind of drama between Fear Not and and anybody like any other company or something, it, yeah, it, people just assume the Tarantula Collective is Fear Not, or you know what I mean that that we're back to back. And I'm like, or they, they'll send me uh they'll send me messages asking about the order. Messages. Like, I have no idea. Like I I don't know anything about the order you placed. I'm not Fear Not Tarantulas. Like oh, I just assumed you were you know that that you and Tanya owned it. I'm like. No, Tanya is a independent businesswoman who's completely capable of owning a tarantula uh, company by herself. Like she doesn't need me, <laughs> and I am not involved. I appreciate Tanya a lot. Like she, I don't know. Like I said, I didn't know what I was doing really, and Tanya's always been very helpful to me. She's always seen something in me to where she's uh, encouraged me to do bigger and better things with my business and even though i'm like you said a competitor for her i know part of it's because she likes to keep an eye on me i know but uh, <laughs> i like i also know it's because she genuinely cares you know and like she cares about the hobby i don't think a lot of people give her enough credit because just because somebody's i understand this more now running the business just because somebody's forced into being a business person doesn't mean they don't care about the hobby Okay. Yeah. And I think her passion still is as strong as it was from day one. And I think people don't give her enough credit for that. She puts up with a lot of crap that people don't realize. And like, you can never really understand what somebody running a business like this goes through until you're sitting in their shoes. So like, again, sometimes it's best just to step out of your box and look up before you get online and feel like you need to just talk smack on somebody really realize that like, 
these people are doing the best they can and like just because they may have not pleased you in the the most perfect manner doesn't mean they aren't trying their hardest so it's very true i mean she's she's definitely got a, a very good passion for the business and i know that just from my conversations with her but she's also she's also very intelligent and a very savvy businesswoman you know so i mean she's like a double threat and i think you know i just have the utmost respect for her and i owe her a huge debt of gratitude because like I started my Facebook group, uh, you know, for a, a myriad of reasons, but, um, it just, it, I, it wouldn't have grown the way it grew without her support. You know, she was kind of like, Hey, you're a, you're an awesome customer. You seem like a nice guy. I like what you're doing. You know? And she offered, she was like to help your, your group grow. You can, uh, offer them your, your followers or whatever, a 10% discount code, you know? And it's like, 10% isn't that much. You know what I mean? You spend, you know, $200, it's 20, 20 bucks off. Um, but people love it. They love discount codes. So I was, I was very appreciative and people have used the heck out of that code. And people love the freebies, the man. Let me yeah. tell you. So I don't even know what this thing is, but y'all confuse me on this. Okay. You guys will put in like a, a $250 order or something like that. And not care one bit about what you ordered, but one like the like yeah, like you cannot you care so much about that freebie. Like I'm like I got you, I got you, and they're like, oh, <laughs> I, I don't, I can't do it. This, this. I sometimes I'm like, I think people care more about their freebie than the order. Like I, it's crazy to me. I'm like, <laughs> people love a good surprise, and people again, people love feeling appreciated. Like I've never once given a curly hair or anything as a freebie. Like yeah. if you're gonna spend enough where you get a freebie from me, I'm gonna make sure you hooked up with something cool. You know, like so. Yeah. I don't know. It just cracks me up. Tanya's a Tanya's a beast, and I I really honestly uh, do a lot of my business practices based on her. I message her regularly and ask her how she would handle certain situations there you have to take into account we do handle life differently uh again like my house is an old open door hers is not uh she has a business uh brick and mortar i do not um but overall the same basics and uh the same passion resides there in both of us and we both understand each other very well and i'm beyond blessed and grateful to be able to call tanya a friend yeah yeah. And that's, that's one thing that I, I really appreciate is that I can have that conversation. I mean, she's really busy right now and I'm really busy, so we don't talk as much as we used to, but you know, it, it, it was, I've learned a lot from her and I've made a lot of connections, um, that I never would have, those doors would not have been open had she not had been there to open them for me, I guess, in some ways, you know, she's, she's a genuinely good person. Uh, and, and yeah, I catch a lot of flack just because of the, you know, the relationship that we have as far as like, you know, it's a business relationship in a lot of ways. Like I promote her business, but I do that because she promotes my YouTube channel or, you know, my Facebook group. It's, 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 it's a, it's a, uh, what's the right, like, you know, I don't want to, what's the right Exactly, word? man. That's why I respect you so much. You use your platform to do good for the hobby. There's a lot of people who don't do that, man. A lot of people. And uh, it's very important to me that like, when you ask me if I would want to come on here, I'm like, dude, he does so much for the hobby. Why would I not want to come here on here? Like, uh, I don't know. It, it just is crazy to me. Like that. How many people uh, think they want to want to do good in the hobby, but end up doing really bad things because they had good intentions, but it ended up bad. So I just want to just personally thank you for always being somebody who I, I feel has always had the hobby's best interest in mind. And I feel Tanya the same way. There's a lot of vendors I feel that way about. A lot. There's amazing people in this hobby. Like nowhere else in the world will you meet people like in this hobby. Yeah. And it's one of those catch 22s. The the more successful you become, uh, the more grief you catch. You know what I mean? The, the more critical people are. Uh, it's true. You know, it's, it's just the way things are. Um, and, and you all have been, you your business, just watching it grow like from i remember when you started simply spiders it was like oh man there's somebody else started a tarantula dealer yeah uh, you know it's just tom like, said the same thing. almost like almost like a countdown like wonder how long he's gonna last and you're still here and you're growing and you it's awesome and the fact that you launched a website like i couldn't be more proud of you thank you dude i'm horrible at taking compliments but that means a lot thank you yeah and, and i think i feel like that's something i said a few times, like when we have had conversations, like, man, you gotta get a website. <laughs> like, 
you know, it, it sucks. I know it's, it's, it's tough to do. I think it's awesome that you've got one. And yeah, I mean, you, I'm, uh, I'm excited for it. I'm going to, I'm still building it. Like it's just a base basics now, but it will definitely be a sight to see once I'm completely finished with it. Yeah. I mean, even if it's just a simple app or yeah, like a simple website, it's just, it's, there's, there's like, it just puts you in a completely different class from like being a dude that's selling spiders on Facebook or on a message board or something and being a dude that has a website. You know what I mean? That like, that makes you uh, official, at least in my book, my perception is, you know, you're, you're a hardcore professional dealer now. I just feel so weird you? when people talk to me like that. I just don't know. I don't look at myself that way. I don't know. <laughs> I look at myself as like this dork running this spider business in his parents' basement. Like, I don't know. Like, yeah, it's it's been a it's been a journey, man. And like I never would have expected it, but anybody could do this. Be good people, man. Like that's all that is. Like do people right in this. And like if you really want your business to succeed, you'll take care of the hobby that's gonna support you. I mean, I, I truly tell my employees this all the time. I don't know why me. Like I don't know why I was lucky enough to be able to be the one out of the eighty people that started a business and ended up being able to make it. But um but I do know it's because of my customers and I do know it's because of like the hobby and like, that's something I will always do as a business owner is make sure that I pay that forward and take care of the customers and the hobby. That's, that's really good, man. I like, I like how I'm learning a lot doing this podcast, you know, meeting people. I mean, we know each other, but I mean, we've just been, we've been talking for hours now. Like, I feel like we've really gotten to know each other a lot better. Yeah, than we did. Even with you know, telling her, we got disconnected. I was like, it's been an hour and a half. I was like, I don't feel like it's been an hour and a half. <laughs> Yeah. And it's, so I'm like, I'm really getting to know a lot of people and it seems like each podcast kind of has its own, it's not something that we do intentionally, but there's, there seems to be this like theme that develops. And I feel like in our podcast, the theme has been be good to like treat people with, with respect and be good and good things are going to happen to you. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, that, that's, that's how I, I even have the ability to have a podcast, you know, but or a YouTube channel is just like being supportive of other people and, and just the, the love and support I've got back in return has been exactly. that you know what i've been able to give out same thing you know what you're saying right now is you treat people with respect treat newcomers with respect you know help people out don't tear people down like i mean these are very positive life lessons <laughs> that is coming about just because we're talking about tarantulas i think that's yeah i'm fun. just i just know man like uh it's been very good getting to know you over the course of the time uh, that we've known each other and like i just very honored to be here and like uh, i figured if i was going to be able to take the time to uh talk to the general public like this i wanted to make sure that like people understood like the hobby should hold itself to an expectation you know and like there is no reason that we can't be what everybody talks about the hobby being, um, and continue to grow in the future that way like right now is a lot of a very pivotal point in this hobby and if we continue to allow certain things as a hobby to go certain directions there's an end result that may not be positive so I just want to be on the side that's like making positive changes for the hobby. And um, yeah. my intentions with this business is just to, to be a good example and try to provide you all with quality animals and do things ethically. So, yeah. And, and to put this on the listeners and the viewers of this podcast, like that's on you all more than anything. Like Dustin can, can have his, his principles and morals and, and do business the best he thinks I can make videos the way I think is best. And, are in line with my my morals and expectations but it all comes down to to you all that are listening and watching right now like what videos are you watching like the what whatever types of videos you're watching you're you're perpetuating that um you're making it more successful and and that's you know whatever business it is you're spending your money at you're perpetuating that business so if you're spending money somewhere in that's with someone that's that's doing the right thing and and helping other people out and trying to better the hobby you're just going to be perpetuating the betterment of the hobby and the education of other people. If you're trying to save a few bucks and you're, you're spending money with somebody that's illegally importing tarantulas or a, a pet store, that's like just bringing in wild caught and sell, you know, selling them. Yeah. You know, it you're perpetuating that, that behavior all the way up and down the chain. So you, we're essentially, we're, we're creating our future by uh, where we spend our dollars, you know? So take that into consideration. Yep. Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe it's a, uh, I don't know. I guess what I'm just trying to say is, spend your money responsibly and think about what, where, who you're buying from or what you're watching or what you're listening to, because you, in doing so you are creating the future of the hobby. You're deciding what direction 
this hobby goes. Yeah, and you, it comes down to the respect of the animal too. At that, you know, like you encourage that stuff. How much do you really respect that animal? How much do you respect the hobby as a whole when you're encouraging that kind of stuff? I don't know. Uh, I, I just encourage people the same as Richard to take a step back and look and purchase from people who you think are doing things right, people who care and about the hobby, who care about the animals, who uh, don't have to go out and snag wild, 50 wild-caught animals out of one location. Uh, I don't know. It's very, very easy to say things and talk the talk and not walk the walk, you know. And I feel a lot of this hobby at this point in time, if we just get our act together, we can walk that walk in a very straight path, and it can be a very, very beautiful sight, you know. Uh, but right now is the time in that hobby or in this hobby, uh, this hobby is growing into something that's uh, amazing. It really is. I never would have thought 10 years ago this hobby would have been what it is right now. But uh, So what Dustin is saying is uh, make sure your video is matching your audio. I think that's what I'm going to name the, the, the title of the podcast. Make sure your video matches your audio. Yeah. Exactly. Your actions are, are in line with what you're saying. Yeah. And I just, it's, it's a lot easier. I don't know. Somebody recently said to me, it's a lot harder to be a good person than it is just to be a crappy one you know and uh i think that really reads out like really hit home with me so uh, i don't know i always try to remember that even if it's gonna cost me money i usually try to make sure everybody's taken care of and uh, feels loved i think this world if we learned what love actually is and like how to care for people properly a lot of the dumb stuff we do on a day-to-day basis learn to love people learn to love the hobby i think it's pretty and to me, it's a pretty easy key to success, but uh, yeah. just I want to be one of those people helping guide people in that direction, you know? That's awesome, man. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you coming down and being on the podcast. Well, I say coming down. You didn't really go anywhere. You're you're at your home. This is hey, I had to come down to my face. virtual. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just want to make sure that everybody goes and checks out your website. It's scrolling across the bottom of the screen. I'll have it linked in the description. Uh, it's just simplyspiders.org. Uh, you learn about Dustin, um, the people that's working. That's all a little about section there. You had little bios on everybody in your company there. Uh, see what he's got for sale. Uh, you're also on Instagram, Simply Spiders. Yeah, that's LCD. Simply Spiders LLC on Instagram. LLC. But yeah. I wanted to what's thank you, Richard. I mean, this way... has been an absolute pleasure, man. Oh, I appreciate that. I, I really want to get it out there. What's the best way if someone needs to get in contact with you? Uh, whether they got a question about it, like they want to place an order. What's the best way? Okay, so basically on the website, it has a chat bar that you can message. Either it goes to me or Jess. And then, but to be honest, the best way is still to hit me up on my personal business page at Dustin Riley Blevins. All orders will be through the website. But if you have a question or you have issues with your spider or need advice or care information, it is 10 times easier to get a hold of me on Facebook through Messenger than it will be through that website. I only have access through that website from a laptop computer. It's not on my phone. Okay. Is Jess still there with you? Uh, Jess is still sitting here, yeah. Any chance she might poke her head around and say hi on camera? Say hi. (laughs) Here she is. (laughs) Hey. Hi. <laughs> awesome yeah so oh, derek's outside he's actually breeding right now in the other room and then jess is in here helping with me and the bubba's out there helping derek so well it's very cool it's very cool to kind of get a look behind the scenes and get to meet you uh on a, on a more personal level you know rather than just our you're you're a uh, you're a voice clip sender i've noticed i send you text messages and you send me voice clips back in, resp- in response it always cracks me up I'm just it's, it's like good. I have fat fingers, and like typing yeah. to everybody like really gets like I'm not a I'm not as bad as a speller as I seem in text messages. I'm just lazy, and if I had to change everything, I screwed up with my fat fingers. It would take me all day. So I just voice message now. I'm just like <laughs> everybody hit me up on my personal page. I can voice message. Yeah, I I, I kind of like that because I I can also download them. And, and use them as evidence against you later on. Like, no, you said this. Here it is in your own voice. No, I got this. It's right here. <laughs> <laughs> this is not, uh, I, I didn't Photoshop this. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Yeah, no, when you were uh, like, but, I'm going to quote you on your video, I was like, cool, quote me. And then I was like, no, he literally took the voice clip I sent him and attached it in there. I'm like, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of cool. Uh, well, man, I really appreciate you coming on. This has been a lot of fun talking. And I, like I said, I highly suggest everybody go check out your website. Uh, let's try to crash it. Well, let's get as many people going there as soon as this podcast comes out. <laughs> Let's rock it. 
Um, Rock it. Yeah. I appreciate it, Richard. You've been awesome, man. As always, keep up with the hobby, man. You're doing a great job. Thanks a lot, man. Well, I appreciate everybody listening. Be sure to uh, follow the Exotic Pet Collective, whether it's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, there's other places too. Google Podcasts, Stitcher, anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can find the Exotic Pet Collective now. And if you want to see a video version of the podcast, just subscribe to the Exotic Pet Collective on YouTube. And you go also find all kinds of links and stuff like that down below that video in the description. So subscribe, follow, do whatever, what you got to do. Check out simply spiders website, simply spiders.org. Follow them on Instagram. And thank you so much for being part of the exotic pet collective. You guys uh, have a great day and we will talk to you next week. Ain't no passing the race. It means no worries for the rest of your days. Uh, right, rocking it out. Simply Spiders, the jingle. I am pretty sure he has that recorded.